Mayor Johnston. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Weirich. Council Member Blatz. Here. Council Member Francina. Here. Council Member Haney. Here. Paul, will you read it? Sure. Can you all join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? And over your hearts, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome everybody. Um, our, uh, we have one Microphone. presentation. Oh, pardon me. Sorry. Welcome everybody. <laughs> we have a presentation from our uh, fire chief. What the annual report? Is that what? Uh, yes. Uh, Norm Plot. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Johnson, uh, distinguished members of the City Council, uh, City Manager, Sheriff Fryhoff, and Council, uh, Norm Plott, uh, with Ventura County Fire Department, West County Operations. And what I'd like to do is to review the analysis of the last year's uh, report with Ventura County Fire Department. But before I do, I'd like to take a moment <coughs> to introduce uh, a member of our team that's also a city resident. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, Celine Mooney. And uh, Celine is our fire planner uh, for the county fire department. And uh, Celine, if you just want to just quickly just give a brief, uh, just a little bit about yourself and. Hello. Hi, I didn't know My we planned the fires, but that's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my name is Celine Mumi, and I am a resident of Ojai. Um, I worked for the Los Padres National Forest for about 16 years prior to coming here. And um, I've been here since June. Um, I work with fire safe councils and community members on hazards, fire hazards around their homes and within the community, and I look forward to working with you all. Okay, welcome, a belated welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Celine. One of the things we're working with is to get a chipper day uh, in the city of Ojai, working with uh, city manager to, uh, for this year to, uh, for the residents. So we're, we had it in the upper Ojai last year, and we thought it would be a good thing to work with the fire safe council to get it in, in the city of Ojai this year. So. Uh, with that, uh, just a little bit of quick update. We had the uh, recent floods uh, event on the on Friday. We was working with uh, uh, Sheriff Fryhoff, and uh, at at the height of that, we ended up having uh, we brought back an extra engine company. Uh, we went into a plan two flooding. We at one time had six engine companies, uh, an extra uh, utility, and a flood task force all in the Ojai Valley handling calls, and it's still at that pace. We still ended up having five calls and pending at one time. So they were there was a lot of things going on with the uh, with the event uh, uh, of the uh, rains, but uh, nobody got seriously hurt here, uh, and uh, uh, all the calls were answered uh, expeditiously. We worked uh, side by side with the sheriff's department, and uh, I really want to give a shout out to the city staff. Uh, one of the things that uh, both engine companies within the city uh, talked about was the city staff, how quick they were to be there, help them uh, unplug drains, and just be there. So I just uh, want to thank uh, city staff for uh, in the public works department for a great job. So thank you. So with that, uh, what I'd like to do is just go over quickly, uh, just a, a recap uh, of last year's activities. Um, we, uh, we had a change of, uh, we actually decreased the number of calls we had in the city of Ojai last year by 3.9%. Uh, medical calls making up 73% uh, uh, of our call volume in 2016 and 72% in 2015. Here's a graph showing the, the calls uh, going back to 2013 and, and uh, shows a little bit of decrease in the amount of calls that we responded to last year. Here's a breakdown of what it looks like uh, bet comparing years 2015 and 16 with the call load, the volumes, and the types of calls, uh, all being fire, rescue, public service, alarms, hazardous conditions, and the, the, the greatest amount of calls in the medical uh, response at 72%. Uh, and these are the other calls by type in comparison with the City of Ojai and the County of Ventura at large. 
Over here is the uh, the calls that uh, the call types on the medicals. Uh, the highest uh, uh, amount was for traffic collisions, uh, followed by uh, sick persons is the call types that we responded to. Here's uh, a look at uh, where some of these calls are generated, uh, these being the uh, medical calls, and you can see the demographics of where they happen within the city boundaries. Uh, these are the areas where we had the fires within the city of Ojai. Um, these, I believe, are the public service calls. And these are where the traffic, it's a little bit hard to see there, but that's where the traffic uh, uh, accidents occurred within the city. Over here are the public service calls where they, uh, where they uh, occur within the city. Uh, those public service calls can be, any, be anything from a snake to a uh, tree down to uh, hazardous conditions, flooding calls, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the big uh, things that happened on March 14th of last year is Engine 21 was upgraded to a paramedic engine, which is a, uh, a great uh, increase in service to the citizens of the Ojai Valley. One of the things that we looked at is we studied the uh, call data. Uh, we looked at our data of where the calls were happening, and we found out that uh, Ojai was one of those areas where, uh, you know, we just had a higher call volume and the need for paramedic service uh, uh, after looking at the data was uh, was an area that we needed to improve on so um, and one of the things that that you do when you upgrade services it takes a partnership so right here is uh, the partnership uh, looking to the left is uh, supervisor Bennett's office uh, was there uh, we worked with lifeline Steve Frank uh, partnership with our private company we worked with the city uh, to the right of that is Fire Chief Mark Lorenzen and then Steve Carroll with the EMS agency working together to, uh, to find a solution and upgrade the service within the city of Ojai. One of the things, this is the new Rosenbauer engine that's being built in, uh, uh, in South Dakota near Jones, South Dakota, if you want to look at your map. But uh, for those that don't know Jones, it's near Sioux Falls. Uh, this engine is going to be in service toward the end of the year. It's the latest and greatest in technology. Uh, I met with the shop folks today, and they said that it has one of the cleanest burning Cummings engine on the market today. So City of Ojai will have the latest technology with the cleanest burning diesel engine that money can buy in today's market. So uh, it'll go down the road without uh, any smoke. It'll, it it's, has the latest uh, 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 technology uh, that, that's on the market. <coughs> And uh, this was at Firehouse World. I know it says 34, but that's what uh, Medic Engine 21 will look like uh, when it's delivered and when you see it uh, running down the city streets uh, later, later this year. So that's the, the finished product. Uh, one of the things is I know the city has been concerned, uh, as we are, about water and water use. So one of the things, uh, this is, uh, if you see over there, 21, this is uh, Engine 21. And this is our firefighters, and we're trying out a new technology. The two, uh, new technology is called a pump pod. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, like the Sheriff's Department, the Fire Department, we need to train with what we do. Well, it's harder to, you, we don't want to be wasting that water. So what we've done is we initiated in this uh, new technology called a pump pod so that the water is recirculated and we can use test our engineers they can pump we can squirt water and it squirts it right back in through a, a, a dead man through the the pump uh, a nozzle right there and just gets recirculated and that way there's no water waste wasted so uh, it just gets reused over and over the right now if you were going down the 101 uh, and was going by state beaches uh, we we're actually doing our testing right there and they were using the pump pods out there so uh, the testing's going on and the water's being reused and nothing's being wasted uh, i bring this up as my final slide and uh, the reason why i wanted to show you this is that uh, we like to think in Ventura County, we get it right. And so this slide detects the amount, or shows you the amount of homes lost due to wildfire from 1999 to 2009. And if you, it might be kind of hard to see, but if you look down San Diego, 7,986 homes lost due to wildfire. Um, quite a few up north. Uh, the number uh, in Los Angeles is 797. And if you can't quite see it, the number lost, number of structures lost in Ventura County over that 10-year period. And the good news is we've, we've had no loss of structures due to wildfire since then is seven. 
So I just want you to say that in Ventura County, <laughs> your, your, <laughs> your fire department uh, uh, works really hard with the homeowners through our weed abatement codes, and it's a whole holistic look at fire prevention and aggressive firefighting to make sure that uh, the residents of Ventura County are kept safe. And that's the end of the report. I'll take any questions. Any, any questions for the chief? Uh, yeah. oh, can you tell us a little bit more about the paramedic engine? Like if someone calls 911, they're having a heart attack, that's what comes? Or do you used to, how does that work? Because we yeah, have such so a So that's a great question. So all of our units have what's called AVL technology in, on them. So no matter where they're, when they're driving down the road, wherever they're at, when a call for a heart attack comes, the engine and the ambulance that's closest to that call get dispatched immediately. So one of the things that's nice in the Ojai Valley is a, a continuous of care. So if you were to get in a, a car accident along the 33 freeway, um, and Ventura City, let's say Medic Engine 1 was to respond, there'd be a paramedic on scene. If that same thing happened in Oakview, there's a paramedic provided by the uh, fire station right there. If it was at the intersection of Baldwin, Lifeline Ambulance has a paramedic right there. And if you get to Ojai, there's a paramedic right here in Ojai. So the, what happens a lot of times too is that we in the Ojai Valley have multiple calls. Uh, the sheriff will tell you the same thing. Sometimes things happen in groups and so it's nice to have uh, that backup available in the event that there's a heart attack or more than one call at one time or uh, a lot of the units are going up on a traffic accident up highway 33 there's still a paramedic here in the city of Ojai so it's just that uh, coverage that we've been looking for especially when multiple calls uh, the paramedics can start advanced life uh, care uh, defibrillator heart um, we can uh, start an IV give cardiac drugs uh, use them a McGill forceps to get a somebody that's choking or um, be able to take and reverse the the cause of anaphylaxis due to be sting or that sort of thing oh, excellent can I ask one other question <clears throat> how, how much did you, what was the statistic on traffic collisions the increase because it seemed like you said a very significant number well it just happens to be that's where we had a lot of people injured in, due to traffic accidents in last year but it, does that mean that there is an increase in collisions uh, I'd have to look at the numbers, but there, it was the leading cause of injury that we had last year uh, for our stats. Okay, that's important to know. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any other questions of the chief? Ron, thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. Uh, before, we, before we go further, I wanted uh, to uh, suggest to the council that we possibly reorder the items that, as we, we talk about them, and I hope it doesn't goof us up on the. <laughs> the pink slips and the numbers, but uh, Councilman Haney made, I thought, a good suggestion that uh, following the consent agenda, if we were to move the uh, appointments for the Arts uh, and Recreation Commission up, that'll be a quick item, and then go directly to the uh, public uh, meeting regarding tourism, which I, from the looks of the audience, that many of the people that are here tonight came to, to speak on that. Uh, and then we would go to our uh, public hearing and take our oral reports at the end of the agenda. Does anybody have a? Yeah, oral reports huh? at the end okay, is good. That's, okay, we'll, uh, we will then, <coughs> we'll, we'll go to public comment. Uh, let's see what, what we have here. In the well, I have two. Uh, I, I believe you yeah, under public comment, uh, Tony Thatcher and uh, Mark Lewis on deck. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. I'm here to remind you about Ojai Centennial Jubilee Weekend, which is uh, April 7th and 8th. On the 7th, we'll be having a play called The Birth of an Ocean, Ojai. 1917, put on by OPAT and the museum. Suitable for all ages, it's in Libby Bowl, it's about an hour long. Professional actors, and it's uh, free admission with open seating. And then the next day on the 8th is when we're having the Jubilee picnic in the park. And that's again from 10 to two. 
It's free to everybody. We hope to get a really good turnout from the Valley members. Um, it's a picnic. We want to invite everybody to celebrate what happened 100 years ago when Mr. Libby handed the deed to uh, the post office and the park to the Ojai Civic Association. And that will consist of, uh, we'll have the uh, veterans with the flags, we'll have the Nordhoff Band, we'll have a few speeches, uh, and then we'll have some fun and games. So we've invited any civic group that wants to uh, attend to have a booth there, and the deadline is this weekend, so anybody knows a civic group that hasn't responded, uh, please get the word to me. Um, and it'll be, a, it'll be a lot of fun, and it, it's a picnic. And I have a flyer. I'll leave them out here on the table and on the way in, and hope you all will come to that. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and thanks for the work on planning the event. And you wear a costume. This is this is a typical Thatcher student costume. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So great. Mark Lewis. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor uh, Johnson, Council. We're double teaming you tonight. I'm. Uh, Mark Lewis, I'm the president of the board of directors, and uh, as my colleague Tony Thatcher just pointed out, we're about to celebrate, as you all know, the centennial of the Ojai makeover, Nordhoff to Ojai, the new architecture, the new name. The guy that made that all possible, as you also all know, is uh, Edward Libby. He did not actually live in Ojai most of the year. He was a Toledo, Ohio resident. And as part of all this, uh, we want to alert you that this Sunday at the museum, 4.30 to 6, we're having an event which uh, explores uh, which will actually bring in some people from our um, sister city, Toledo, Ohio, to talk about the connections there. We have some f folks from the Libby House, which is a national historic um, register of historic places house in Toledo. We have uh, the, the uh, archivist from the Toledo Museum of Art, a nationally known museum founded by Libby there. He did actually more there than he did here, just bigger here because we're smaller. And we'll also have the... Um, creative director of Libby Glass, which still exists. And Libby Glass was the firm where Libby got all his money. So everything he did here, the post office, the arcade, the pergola, the oaks, the uh, former St. Time, St. Thomas uh, Aquinas Chapel, which is now the museum, the Ojai Valley, in and on and on. The money all came from Libby Glass, and they do some interesting stuff. And that, all those folks will be here at the museum for Town Talk on Sunday, 4.30, May, March 5th. And we hope to see many of you here or there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Should be interesting. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone else who, uh, under public comment, that didn't? That, uh, <laughs> Chief. I just stand corrected because uh, my eyesight isn't quite what it used to be. Uh, <laughs> the number one. <laughs> I couldn't see it that far. The number one cause for. Uh, the medical calls was actually falls, not traffic accidents. So it's falls, falls, TCs, and then sick person. So I just wanted to correct the record. Sorry for that. That's Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. No? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and that brings us to the consent calendar. Uh, so I move to approve the consent calendar. I have a motion. Items 1A through H. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Uh, <laughs> I guess there wouldn't be any discussion on consent unless someone wants to pull something. Otherwise, will the clerk call the roll? Council Member Francina? Yes. Council Member Haney? Yes. Mayor Johnston? Yes. Council Member Blatz? Yes. Okay, now we're going to take up item three. And uh, you have a report in your agenda. Uh, Councilman, uh, or pardon me, Mayor Pro Tem Weirich is not with us to this evening, but he and I. Uh, served along with the chairman of the commissions and did the interviewing and we have uh, two nominees uh, Stuart Crowner and Marcy Tosher and I See Marcy is here, but uh, Stuart out there anyway, though They are the um, Nominees to serve on the Arts Commission the two vacancies and uh, Jay Hirsch uh, to fill the vacancy on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Do I have a motion? I to approve. Yes. I'll move to approve. Mm -hmm. What is it? Jay, that's the, the Parks and Recreation is 
Eric Jacobson. Jay Hirsch. What do we have? What do you have? Wrong name. Oh, well, that's not good. Uh, let's just. Is there a Hirsch somewhere? Yeah, there's Jay Hirsch on here. So ours commissioner would be uh, Marcy Torche Marcy. and Stuart Crowder. Stuart. Well, what is this other application we have in here? Just a, a third application, oh, okay. two spots. <laughs> this is like the Academy Awards. All right. Okay. Let me, let me, let me, this is like the Academy Awards, sort of. <laughs> Man, not quite. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll, we will start that again. Uh, for best picture of the year. <laughs> oh, it would be best for, art. For the art, for the art commission, we best have. Best artist. <laughs> yeah, best artist. Uh, Marcy Tosher and Stuart Crowner. Yeah. And uh, for the Parks and Recreation Commission, we have Eric Jacobson. Okay, now. Now I move to approve. Okay, thank second. you, Randy. We have a motion. Do we have a second to that second, motion? Second, second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Do I have it right, Clerk? Great choice. <laughs> okay. Great choice. Uh, call the roll. Yeah. Council Member Haney? Yes. Mayor Johnston? Yes. Council Member Blatz? Yes. Council Member Francina? Yes. Okay, motion passed. Do we get to meet them? Do what? Do we get to meet them? I, well, we, yes, yeah, Marcy, Marcy, I see Marcy there. I don't know. Say Marcy, a few you want words. to at least stand up and yourself. wave? You don't know, we won't require any public speech just unless you have prepared something. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> And is Stuart out there? Not that they had to be, okay. Receiving on behalf of Stuart? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> and no Eric? Okay, I think Eric's working. Okay, thank you. Uh, our, should I have this right? Our next item, I guess, will be, we'll go uh, directly to uh, the um, Ojai Tourist Improvement District public meeting, and I have a number of cards, but uh, I think everyone by now, do we need a staff report on that? It's your pleasure, Mayor. Uh, basically, the recommendation tonight is simply for the council to receive public comment. Uh, there will be a subsequent, uh, there will be a public hearing scheduled for this matter on March 28th at 7 p.m. as well. People can also address the council at that time as well if they would wish. Right. And at that time, the council will actually take an action tonight. It's merely to receive information from the community. So, uh, is it Michael Addison? Then, oh, yes, there, Michael. <laughs> oh, this is item three. Pardon me. Yes, I was <laughs> merely here to advocate the appointment of the two new Arts Commission <laughs> members, and I think the council made a very wise choice. You're very, Thank very you. <laughs> <laughs> very, very persuasive, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> and for some reason, they batched you in with uh, item number four. So we'll. Who else did I have here on item number three? That we, oh, we have is it Neil, Neil McGuire? Did Neil want to uh, also second the motion? Uh, that should be for item number two, I believe. I apologize. <laughs> you shouldn't apologize. <laughs> I think that the, whoever filed these thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, uh, Mark Whitman, we are now on our regular, the topic of the uh, <coughs> Improvement District. Um, members of the City Council, thanks for letting me speak here tonight and uh, thank you for everything you guys are doing. I know what, what a time it takes to do what you're doing and, and I really appreciate um, all the good work that the City Council does. But I think the, um, the last meeting we were um, talking about the same subject and I don't want to be redundant and, and um, say the same things, but you know, last time I, my, I think my main point was let's send the right message to, to our community, to the hardworking people out there who are you know, trying to make a living and, and relying on the tourist economy. And, um, and but um, I think Tony uh, Thatcher's you know presentation tonight about um, Edward Libby I think it was very fortuitous um, because I think um, you know he came to Ohio as a tourist 
way back in the day and stay at the Ojai, the Foothill Hotel. And, um, and he really, you know, he's what he, his vision of, you know, of Ojai and creating, you know, um, the beautification of Ojai, I think is what um, he was all about. And I would, if, if people haven't gone over to the museum to see that exhibit, it's, you know, really educational and some great history. And I'd like to, I'd like to learn some more about, you know, what, what was uh, conspired during that era and, and what, you know, what was the, what is the foundation of Ojai and, you know, what was Libby's vision? What I could tell from that exhibit, he was just, he was trying to make a beautiful place to influence people, to, you know, to make us, you know, richer and better people, you know, for it. And so we're, you know, we're on, we're on his coattails. Um, we're benefiting from, from that vision. And, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it's a you know, great benefit to us. And, and, and now people are pouring. <laughs> and I, you know, I admit there is a boom in our economy as of late, but it came after the recession of, oh, you know, 07, 08, 09, when, you know, things are really bad. I mean, I was out of work <laughs> and, you know, now, now things are good and, and, uh, and you know, people, uh, things are finally, you know, getting good for, for the, a lot of the shop owners. But some of the shop owners are, you know, talking about, you know, a, a, a drop in their business after the STR, not banned, but you guys decided not to keep them. And we haven't felt the effects of um, the county's ban yet. That's that's gonna that's down the road, and so um, it, you know we're you know we're not sure what you know what that's gonna do to, to the tourist economy and and what happens at the next recession, which it's gonna come. We know, you know this this is a good economy, but we know the recessions. Uh, you know I've been through about three of them. I'm sure you guys have too. But recessions come you know they're gonna it's gonna happen again and so what's gonna happen in our next recession and how are we gonna you know are we gonna have to you know go back and start all over again and I know I have eight seconds left here but or is, is that right <laughs> am I going with my time <laughs> I'm, okay well that's that's pretty much my point thank you thank you Mark Marcy Tosh I'm speaking, I'm reading uh, something that Nigel Chisholm wrote, and um, I'm going to read half of it. It's pretty lengthy, and then um, Megan's going to come up and read the other half. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> this is Nigel. As a downtown business owner, I do believe that Ojai should invest in tourists, regardless of what we believe as to whether one thinks that Ojai has reached tourist saturation point or not, tourists have been and will continue to be the lifeblood of this city. It is important that we work to sustain our tourist trade. Having said that, I do believe the following should be carefully examined. Number one. The question is how best to do that within the confines of a citywide plan for sustainable community-oriented growth. We should not be in the business of thinking that we need more if we don't have a clear idea of how many is enough. Only so many sardines will fit into a can. We can't make a bigger can, so it's all about the sardines. Number two. The only entity that has the best interests of the whole community in mind is the city itself, manifested through our elected city council. I do not accept that a private entity that has solely the interest of its paid membership in mind operates in the best interests of the whole community. It operates quite obviously, as one would expect, in the interest of its members, regardless of the alleged mechanisms in place to mitigate such issues. I believe that any funding of tourist outreach or city promotion should be dealt with directly by the city. I'm going to keep on going. Number... Two, any and all funds should be withheld until a reliable mechanism. Did I say that? Yeah. No. Did I say that? Okay. No. Until a reliable mechanism is created to track and account for any funds distributed on both a fiscal and benefit basis. When such a mechanism exists, it should be reviewed and updated annually. Additionally, a report should be issued every six months addressing the mechanism's requirements. Number three, extending funding in even the current amount for 10 years is simply bad business. 
and, and bad governance, especially so when there's next to no acceptable mechanism to prove that the money is creating value or even knowing what the value should be to begin with. No business in the world would do such a thing, but every business in the world would be extremely happy to accept such a handout. I believe that even this existing deal breaks your fiduciary duty to your citizens. Oh, Nigel. If the city is in the business of giving out free money for no proven return, I'd like to know to whom I should send in my request, as I'd like a piece of that action. <laughs> I promise that I'll use it wisely. I won't prove it, but I absolutely promise that I will. Thank you, Marcy, uh, or Nigel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, the uh, next speaker, Megan Berkwood. Hi, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so, to continue with Nigel, oh, I see no legitimate reason to increase the funding of the OTID as we do not seem short of tourists. Where's the benefit? Number five, given the water crisis upon us, it is by no means certain that we should be looking at increasing tourism. Six, if a business is solely reliant on tourists, they need to change their business plan instead of relying on governmental largesse to bail them out. I say that as a big old lefty, I trust tourists, but I love locals more. I love tourists, but I love locals more. That's what he said. Let's pay attention to our locals who actually inhabit and are this community. At worst, you should extend the OTID as it was for two years. That would allow the council to appropriately reevaluate the entire situation without negatively impacting anyone or anything. What's the hurry, folks? Nigel. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I, I can't help but comment that. Should we give a clarification on where the money's coming yeah, from? Yeah, I, I think okay. we should. Yeah, the, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just for the benefit of the audience and anyone listening at home, uh, this isn't, uh, quote, largesse from the city. This, I call it a, a, a contrivance for uh, around the tax limitations of California, but it allows businesses under certain circumstances to assess a fee on themselves for a specific purpose for which they believe they benefit. So the hoteliers, the, the hostelries, the bed and breakfast would be levying this fee and ha are currently levying this fee on the tourists or the sardines that they're <laughs> bringing into town. Uh, and that money then goes into a fund and is administered uh, through a, an organization that uh, is affiliated with our Chamber of Commerce. And the purpose is, is to advertise the community and promote people to come visit us. So it isn't quite large as, and uh, I would agree with uh, you know, the Councilman Blatt's concern that we, we don't want to be misrepresenting that part of it. There are the other issues that were in the letter. Uh, I'll have to, are, are, are you minions from, uh, uh, <laughs> from the vine? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, tell De Mr. Despicable we'll, <laughs> we'll be in touch, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Akabi. Is Aka be here? No? no, I can put you at the back if you'd like. I see no, nobody ever sits in the reserved for next speaker. Yeah, I'll, I'll call, yeah, and, the, and uh, Sean Mason on deck then. He can come up and Sean get it. Sean Mason on deck. We'll move it along a little. Um, I spoke to this issue, whatever it was, a month or two months ago, or I, everything's blurry to me now. So I feel like I might um, be redundant in, you know, speaking again. But um, the other day on Sundays, I work in a store in town who actually had an anxiety attack this Sunday. And I'm not prone to that, but I got completely, and I started off on the bad note anyway, the day, but I got completely <coughs> overwhelmed trying to find parking <laughs> in this town. I drove around for literally like 25 minutes and I ended up having to park like two and a half blocks away from you know where I would work. And it's not ideal. I don't like leaving in the dark because I leave in the dark and having to walk two or three blocks after a full day, you know, full day. And I just, um, I actually ended up not going in because I was not in a, I'm like, I can't, actually handle 
strangers right now. I can't handle the people that are like, it's, I was overwhelmed by the swarm of people in town with, and like hardly any of the faces I knew. There were just so few. Anyway, that's just an odd example um, of why I would support taking a much more careful review of this um, proposal and, and taking time with it um, as uh, Nigel's, Nigel? <laughs> Nigel in the form of <laughs> suggested. I'm a little confused. <laughs> but um, yeah, to reiterate just briefly um, what I said in previous comments is, um, you know, I've lived here 41 years. I was born here. I've watched a long evolution of Ojai. And for the most part, it was a sort of slow growth. And we were able to adapt a little at a time. But the last four or five years since we've had this relationship um, with this 1% thing, um, it's increased dramatically. It's not like it's sort of like, ooh, we bumped it up and that's good and we're at a certain level. It's a domino effect. It just, it dominoes on itself. And it snowballs, I should say. And so I, you know, even though the level might stay the same, whether it's 1% or 1.5 or 2, the amount of people that it brings in it, it just domino, domino, dominoes. And I really do see that the quality of life will be affected if we don't do this really smartly. And when that quality of life is affected, we don't draw the same kind of people. We don't, we lose the people that are our community that we so treasure. I mean, after my daughter graduates from high school, I'm considering leaving this valley. And, um, and it makes me sad, but some of the things that I care about here, I see changing. And um, I'm looking for a smaller community that has that really hometown feel and not a lot of strangers. Um, but you know, I also value the people that it brings. I value, um, I've, I value that it brings some great people to us too. I'm not, I, I feel like I'm, I'm walking a fine middle ground here with my feelings on this, but I do strongly think we need to take mm -hmm. take review. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sean Mason is up, uh, and Scott Eicher's on deck. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, so I don't, I mean, I talked last time, so I don't know that I have a lot to add to what I said before. And I, uh, I mean, I fully appreciate the challenge that you have because, well, I mean, I went, when I went to law school, I went to law school to be a mediator. So one of my strong points is I can see different sides, and one of my weak points is I can see the different sides. So I have a lot of compassion and empathy for people who are just residents here and live here um, and the whole traffic thing. I uh, am a shop owner, so um, I am definitely representing a biased <coughs> point of view in terms of business. Um, and I liked a lot of what Nigel said because there is something, and there were some things that people said last time about, you know, if, you, it, if it grows too fast, the very reason people come here gets lost because now there's too many people here. Um, and I don't know yet where, where we are in that, in that spectrum. Do we already have too many people? Do we not have too many people? Um, but as a shop owner, um, tourism does make a difference for me. Um, and, you know, I've only had a shop for two years, so I'm a new business. Um, and as I said last time, you know, we're not profitable yet. This year, I know this year it's going gonna, it's gonna to be this year that we become profitable. And we do enjoy a lot of local support. So, um, you know, like Nigel, I mean, I, you know, without local support, we wouldn't be anywhere. Um, but we also enjoy the tourists. Um, and something that, and I don't know if this is part of this uh, decision making or, or determining, you know, whether we go to 10 years or five years or two years, and is it 1% or 2% or percent and a half? Um, Liz from Azu said something. It's like, you know, the weekends, we have a lot of people here on the weekends. So we don't have too many people here during the week. Um, and I remember, I forget which hotel owner talked about, you know, they, they don't have 100% occupancy. But I suspect on the weekends, it probably gets close to 100%. But during the week, if there's something we could do to 
have it be more evenly distributed so that we do have people that can come here and enjoy Ojai, but they're not just doing it on Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday where we're already impacted. So um, anyway, as a shop owner, I, um, I appreciate the challenging decision that you have, and um, I don't yet have the experience of too many tourists. <laughs> so, okay, right. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Scott Eicher. Good evening, Council and staff. Um, I don't have too much to say here tonight. Uh, you've heard a lot from me already, but I do want to say that we are seeking to maintain the current level of tourism and not increase it. The OTID is a group of hotel owners who have decided to increase the productivity of their hotels by marketing them along with the city and the Valley of Ojai. The marketing efforts paid for with hotels assessments of their clients benefits a large number of local businesses that do not have the time, the funds, or the expertise to market themselves. The funds that will cover the OTID expenses will be generated solely by the hotels within the agreement. The city has not contributed to these efforts in two years. There will be no funds coming from STRs or vacation rentals. We agree with the city about removing the vacation rentals from both the city and the unincorporated area of our uh, management district plan area map. There are two vacation rentals currently on the Ojai Visitors Bureau website and those will be removed on October 31st of this year. We need to increase our revenues to maintain the level of marketing currently at play and to rebuild our reserves. We may need to increase the assessment rate at some point over the life of the renewal, but that increase can only be granted by the City Council and can only be requested at the annual renewal date. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I ask a question? I don't know if Scott no. could answer it. No. I can wait to ask. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. If you make it. Yeah. Is once whatever is approved <coughs> is approved on March 28th, can the can a future city council change that? Is this is it written in stone? A 10-year contract? I mean, you know what are. Those are questions I have, a lot of people have. Okay. Well, that's a question for the city attorney, but we don't need to get into that right no, we don't moment need until we get all the comments. I just uh, thought if Scott, right, but, yeah. But it's okay. a good point. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Carolyn Von Drisco with Jerry Dunn on debt. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and City staff. Carolyn Von Drisco. As you take the next step in the decision whether and under what terms to renew the OTID, please assess the matter with a bird's eye view, a view that takes into account all of the things that make Ojai the community in which we all want to live and that tourists want to visit. Before you render your decision, please take affirmative steps to gather necessary information as to potential negative impacts of the ongoing and increasing marketing of Ojai on water, traffic, neighborhoods, our local economy, local housing supply, schools and air quality, to name a few. Otherwise, we may continue to see input such as that published recently in the Ojai Valley News by a longtime resident who says that, quote, it has been painful to watch Ojai devolve from a town for its residents into a Potemkin village for tourists with residents as props, end quote and by a tourist who says that, quote, traffic was so backed up, I wondered why anyone would think this town was worth their time to visit. It seemed like tourists looking at other tourists, not worth our time or effort to try to find something special about the place, end quote. We need to make informed decisions now as to what constitutes a sustainable and successful community business model for Ojai residents, visitors, and our local economy alike for today, but also for tomorrow. By considering the big picture now, then we as a community will thrive, our residents, our businesses, and our visitors. We will keep Ojai the place where we want to live and tourists want to come. Please don't make this decision prematurely, lightly, or narrowly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Dunn and Aaron Embry on deck. Hi, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jerry Camarillo Dunn. I've lived in Ojai for 33 years. and. Before we rubber stamp the tourism budget, it seems prudent to weigh all sides of marketing Ojai to tourists. Visitors are our bread and butter, and we want to attract them, but consider the danger of being too successful. 
I've been a travel writer for 40 years, mostly for National Geographic. I have never seen a small town benefit from overpromotion to tourism. I've also lived in Aspen in the 1970s when this little Colorado mining town was being sold, actually sold out, to the tourist industry. And I think we have to question if Ojai is in similar danger, are we becoming a tourist town? A tourist town is a commercial product, an uh, image that's being sold. You think of Santa Barbara, and that's an example. I think we're teetering on the edge. As people have said, weekend throngs bring Ojai Avenue to a crawl. It's hard to find parking. Um, many residents avoid downtown on Saturday and Sunday. There's a walking tour called Eating Ojai, which I think sounds kind of ominous. <laughs> <laughs> An another business sells bike tours through the East End and their advertising, they say that they can handle large groups. This is how a small town gets swamped with tourists. I think we have to decide, do we the people of Ojai want a life or a lifestyle? An authentic community or a soulless tourist town? And on the other side, are the crowds getting what they came for? You know, an unhurried, unspoiled village. The Tourism Improvement District spends nearly half a million dollars a year to promote Ojai, and I think we're fast becoming a brand name with national recognition. Our Visitors Bureau works with a big PR firm to encourage travel writers like me to write, blog, and broadcast about Ojai. In just the past year, they've generated 45 stories. You'll see headlines like Finding Ohm in Ojai in the American Airlines magazine, and on Yahoo Travel, Weekend Getaway, Girls Gone Ojai. <laughs> All this means more visitors, but the number of tourists we attract should not exceed our capacity. That's our capacity to live an authentic life in our own town, and visitors' capacity to discover what makes Ojai special. Let's protect our small town from being irrevocably damaged by overpromotion. Many of us think Ojai has already reached the limit. I hope the council will table the tourism budget until you've seriously considered the big picture of tourism itself and Ojai's future. Here's the hard truth. Once our lovely, fragile town is lost, it's gone forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Embry is up with Peggy Lucera on deck. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Council. My name's Aaron. I moved here about 13 years ago. I'm a pianist. I'm on the faculty of the Ojai Youth Opera here. Um, my daughter is a student here. Um, before I go further, can I disarm everyone with find your pink moment and upscale bohemian chic in the same sentence as chumash <laughs> for a moment? We would consider by this. Four months ago, the house that we were renting for six years, I've never had a credit card. My wife and I have never owned any property. We were renting a house for six years behind the Vons, and the owners wanted to sell, so we were forced to move in September. We were paying $1,800 a month. The house that we're living in now on Golden West near the fire station we're paying $1,900 a month, and the owners want to move in in September at the end of our lease. So we're looking at listings, and lo and behold, we see the house that we moved in four months ago. We moved out of four months ago. We were paying $1,800 in that house. Now it's going for $2,800 a month. That's a four months ago. And, and, um, and, and I don't know any educator or artist or anyone else who's really in the fabric of this community that makes it so fabulous to be here can really sustain that kind of living expense. And um, I, I love it here. I, I, have a lot of, I have a lot of friends here that are becoming family to me. And there's a new artist collective now that's opening in Miner's Oaks. It's called Greater Goods. It's next door to the Arrowheart Yoga and Cardinale's Music Shop. Um, right next to the bookends bookstore. We're, we're doing lots of things in conjunction with Farmer and the Cook and a lot of community-centered um, discussions and arts programs and, and um, you know, 
I really want I wanted to I wanted to come here and talk about the underutilization of Libby Bowl. <laughs> but in the spirit of solidarity, I decided to talk about this tourism thing. And 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 I'm I'm a shop owner too. I sit at my piano and I play for people at the farmers market every Sunday morning. And most of them are tourists. But I think really most of them are actually Angelinos coming to find their pink moment. So, you know, I mean, we have to be, we have to be real here. I think the majority of the people that come here to Ojai are f coming from Los Angeles. And, and, um, and marketing uh, to Los Angeles with this romanticized kind of manifest destiny Western thing. It's not in the spirit of the Latino community. It's not in the spirit of the Chumash community. It's not in the spirit of Fernando Tico. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and the legacy of, Ed, Ed, you know, the pageantry of Edward Libby is great. I think that's awesome. And we're coming around the centennial now, and we're talking about this stuff, and I think it's a timely discussion. But the legacy of Edward Libby is over. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Peggy Lucera uh, with Jennifer Haley next. Hi, I've spoken, um, thank you, Mayor Johnston, members of the City Council. I've spoken about this issue before and um, I've read a <laughs> number of the letters that are being read tonight and I don't want to um, repeat a lot of the uh, very elegantly stated arguments that you're going to hear from people like Michael Haley and have already heard from Carolyn Von Driska and Nigel Chisholm via Marcy and, and others. Um, very appreciative of Aka B's statement and Aaron Embry's statement. And I think about the artists in this community, people like Carmen Abollera, who's uh, landlady is um, elderly, and when she goes, where will Carmen and and Eric Anderson go? She's my favorite artist in in Ojai and has been for a very long time. And and uh, th there's just um, there's a lot of consideration for the merchants and a lot of consideration for the hotel owners, but there's very little consideration for the people who are creating the culture that makes Ojai the place the tourists want to come. We're, our nation is becoming greed obese. Our town is becoming greed obese. And, uh, you know, we've reached a point where um, we're not even being truthful. You read these pieces. I want to fact check these pieces. Have you read these pieces? Do you think that they're telling the truth about Ojai? There are lots of truths to be told, and some of them contain blatant lies. Blatant lies. Um, we can continue to, you know, bring more and more people in, but. Um, we're creating a town that many of us no longer uh, feel is Ojai. I don't know what it is. Um, I read something on f uh, in, in the Ojai Community Forum today by uh, a friend, uh, Bill Moses, and um, you know he said that you know he's decided that he thinks that he really wants Ojai to be more bucolic. And I thought bucolic, um, it's, it's as if it's a set design. Um, you know, but he talked about how many jobs are being created. And I've heard that from um, Laurel at Azu and many other people were creating jobs. L I'm really tired of hearing that. We're creating jobs that pay 34% of a living wage. The people that have those jobs don't live in Ojai. Half of the people that work at Azu don't live in Ojai. They can't afford to live in Ojai. We're creating a third world culture here. We're creating Ojai as a place where people commute back and forth, creating uh, uh, traffic, uh, increasing emissions in a, in a encased valley. Um, please do the right thing. And 10 years out, that's insane. And I, I don't even think they believe that they could possibly get 10 years. They asked for 10 years so they'd get five years. But culture is increasing exponentially. 
on, on all fronts. And so to making a decision a year out, two years out, and the fact that it takes four years to get good placement in vogue, mm -hmm. it should not be our concern. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Peggy. <laughs> okay, uh, Jennifer? Yeah, hi. With Bill Miley on deck. Jennifer Haley, um, I live in the um, county section of Ojai. Maybe what we can take home tonight is realizing Ojai is already successful. We are truly fortunate to be living in a historically spiritual, safe, and happy community, touched by goodness. Not all places can say they have that. If we move forward the, with the OTID, the business community is pushing for, Ojai will get shortchanged. When business puts itself first, it takes what it wants, when it wants it, without regard to the impact it will have on the community, and the historically understood limitations, mainly water and two-lane road access. It's what I call business chauvinism. The LA Times, New York T Times, Sunset Magazine, and others have run long articles about Ojai. The Ojai Inn and Spa continually brings more business to Ojai by their own investment in advertising itself and the qualities of the town. That's a huge free gift of advertising for the others. What more does the business community want? <coughs> if certain businesses aren't thriving like they think they should, the easy answer isn't getting more advertising money to get people to come to their place of business. They need to take a good look at their own individual business plans. A common mistake people make is creating a business that doesn't pencil out or selling what they potentially like, personally like, but doesn't resonate with customers. The main reason people come here in return is to experience what has always been called the Shangri-La in Ojai. This is rare, and we shouldn't exploit it with expanding tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Bill Miley's up. Uh, Tom Francis on deck. Good evening. For the record, my name is Bill Miley. My family has lived here since 1968. To start with, I know and believe that when, the past, when a past council funded a startup visitors bureau in 210, and then created a tourism improvement district in 212, they saved the city of Ojai from economic disaster. That's a good thing. I consider us now back to normal. Now for the future. I have given the city clerks a set of copies for your council of my extended email comments and requests, census data summaries and data pages on family income and housing costs, an updated chart on city TOT taxes, sales taxes, general fund revenues and my recommendation for what to do. I also provided 20 sets for the public. I believe it would be in the best interest of all of us that a thorough examination be made of the economic life of the city. The census data I provided shows that more and more households and families in our city are in lower income brackets, paying more and more of their annual income for places to live. Many families find it, finds it, they find it hard if not impossible, to establish themselves here. Here's an example. 10 years ago, Nordoff had 1,000 students enrolled. Today, they have 700. We have fewer families. Affordable housing is a great need. Just look at the number of families and households that pay more than 30% of their income for a place to live. I believe that the, the data will show the tourism promotion, OTID, for OHI supports and creates mostly service jobs with annual incomes of less than $40,000. It's hard to raise a family on that in today's OHI. Right now, I believe there is no budgeted, organized, and active effort to promote non-tourism economic development in our Valley or City. We need that for better paying jobs, which will support families and households in a healthy way. In my email that I sent you yesterday, I crafted a set of questions and statements, which I believe if studied along with other issues will help guide our community to a better future. So, I believe, as others do, that the best action for our community by your council would be to extend the current Ojai Tourism Improvement District for two years at 1% and then at the same time create an ad, hoc, an ad hoc study group with members from the community, the chamber, city government, and the council to thoroughly examine all the issues to determine 
what's best for the economic life of our city. To close, let's not be hasty with our city's destiny. It belongs to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I confiscated your uh, other. Excuse me. Oh, I didn't I'm, gl I'm glad you reinvested in the smaller ones. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tom Francis up, uh, Vicki Byrne on deck. Good evening, Mayor Johnson and Council. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of quick things. Um, I, first one is uh, Mr. Eicher made a comment earlier tonight that they're seeking to maintain, not increase, uh, tourism. And what's interesting about that is everything, in the everything that is proposed as present is an increase. So it's proposed to increase from 1% to 1.5% with an allowance to actually go to 2%, which would be double. So it's, at a minimum, it's, it's proposed to increase by 50% and potentially double. Um, and then also the duration, um, 10 years. I don't understand why 10 years would be necessary to maintain the status quo. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so if, if the purpose is to maintain, um, I don't understand why it's proposed as it is. It's just uh, the facts don't support the comment. Um, secondly, um, Mr. Whitman made a comment about the next recession. Um, recessions come and they go. They have uh, for my entire life in California. Um, and what's interesting about that is if you look at, for example, the real estate values, when there's a recession, the, the, the areas that get hit the most and the fastest as far as dropping uh, land values are, vac are vacation areas, people's second homes. And so if we want to be ready for the next recession in Ojai, it seems to me that we would want to diversify our economy and not be so heavily reliant on tourism. Tourism is great for Ojai, it does a lot for Ojai, but I think it's a balancing act, and I think that it's important to consider other options, um, maybe you know, promoting other business ventures that are more ecologically sound for our valley, easier on our local culture, and most importantly, if you look at it through a financial lens, um, ones that will not, you know, essentially disappear or diminish greatly if we have a major recession. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Vicki Burns up, uh, Kitty Johnston on deck. Good evening. Just so I don't appear always crabbing and ungrateful, I really do appreciate <laughs> <laughs> That, uh, that you remove the STRs from the uh, OTID. I really do appreciate that. Okay, so back to crabbing. <laughs> <coughs> um, I have a few questions regarding the OTID that I believe you as council members should have the answers to before making a decision. Does the council have any recourse at all after a vote to modify this plan? What uh, uh, Councilwoman um, Francina said. What happens if you want to slow down the spending? Do you have any way of tracking actual tourist traffic? Can you relate it to an amount of money spent? Is the tourist response straight line or is it exponential? Do you know the traffic level today compared to the last time a traffic study was done 15 years ago? What are your plans if we have total traffic gridlock and do you have any idea how the OTID affects traffic? Do you have the means to evaluate how much tourist traffic is due to the OTID spending versus Airbnb and VRBO who continue to promote short-term rentals in Ohio, which by the way, continue to increase. They are not decreasing in number. Other than your own speculation or that of local businesses or the opinion of the chamber and the outside marketing firm who both, by the way, depend on the OTID for at least part of their compensation, have you investigated whether suspending the OTID for a period of time would actually have a negative effect on tourism? I looked into the marketing budgets of a few other cities to see what they spend per capita, that's per resident, on marketing. 
Napa spends $32 per, their, per resident head. Santa Barbara spends $27. San Inez Valley, including Solvang, spends $44. San Luis Obispo spends $17. Beginning next year, Ojai will spend $79 per resident on marketing. I would caution you not to underestimate the discontent in this community about the current level of tourism. This is a big issue with the residents of Ojai and will definitely be an issue in the next election cycle. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, could we have a copy of those questions? Yes. You, do you want me to? I can. If you have, you know, at your, at your yeah. convenience, email yeah, I, I'll tell you what, I will, I will email, I will email council okay. members. Thank sure. you very much. Kitty I didn't Johnson up to with do Ray the Powers the on deck. <laughs> Mayor Johnston <laughs> <laughs> and Council. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> I hadn't planned to, to speak tonight. I don't have, I'm trying to make some notes so I don't sound like a complete idiot, but uh, someone raised the question of when is enough enough, and it really struck me. Because the other day I was riding through town, taking my grandson home from school, and he looked at me and he said, Grandma, why are there so many strangers in town? And I looked at him and I said, honey, how can you, he's 14, 14. I, he's lived here all his life. I said, how can you tell there's strangers? And he, go, he looked at me like I was an idiot and he said, well, can't you tell? <laughs> <laughs> and it made me think of the town my kids grew up in, that my grandchildren uh, aren't experiencing. And it was a town of interconnectedness. And I look out and I see the young man who taught my children swimming, who then, became a famous architect and remodeled our house. And I see Monchichi, who was in his Boy Scout troop, and I see Akabi, to whom I look up to now, and I've known <laughs> since she was a tiny child. And I think, that's Ojai. It's all these interconnectedness of, of coming together. And um, I don't know if that helps your decision, but, but to me it was sort of iconic of where we are and where we were. And the th only other thing I wanted to say was that uh, I had lunch, this was some time ago, with a friend of mine with whom I worked at Monica Ross for many years. And she got this startled look on her face and looked around the restaurant and said to me, Kitty, do you know anybody here? Do you recognize any of the faces? And I looked around and I said, absolutely not one. And that was an epiphany for both of us. And we never had lunch in week on the weekend in Ojai again. But, um, but it, it is a different way to live in a town when you, when you go in and everyone's a stranger. And it makes me sad that my grandchildren feel they live in a town of strangers. Thank you. Ray Power is up with uh, Michael Haley on deck. Hello, Ray Powers, 788 Matilla Hot Springs Road. I'm speaking personally, not as a uh, member of the uh, Plan City Planning Commission. Um, I'm a systems thinker. To me, everything is connected, so we can't, for me, I can't look at tourism or our economy or the drought or affordable housing as separate subjects. Um, they are all interwoven. I wrote a little something I want to read. 2017 is the 100-year centennial celebration of the naming of Ojai. In an inspired 1917 speech, Edward Libby suggested a name change from Nordoff to Ojai. It was voted upon and accepted, and so today, <laughs> it seems both timely and appropriate to once again ask, what will Ojai look like? a hundred years from now. I know that's a far reach. Can we envision the future with greater clarity? What decisions, policies, and lifestyle changes need to be acted upon now, or not, to ensure that the next hundred, hundred years are built on a solid foundation of foresight, honor, and respect with regard to conservation, economy, and healthy communal living? Can we wholeheartedly become a model of social design and sustainability in all manner of speaking? And if that's possible and practi practical, what would it take to achieve this? Does being hyper-focused on the tourism industry create a dependence that will eventually corrupt the inherent fabric and essence of the Ojai Valley? Is it still a viable option 
and or is it even supported by the majority of Ojai's residents? How do we maintain a balance between economic stability and quality of life? Can we foster widespread community dialogue to explore the diversification of our revenue streams in order to be less reliant on tourism? Ojai is in perpetual motion with its increasing visitor population, but it may be a case where the extra marketing and efforts to get the word out are benefit benefiting the few rather than the many. Indeed, when does economic viability become exploitation? It's important to have foresight and envision the OHA we want in 2050, if not 100 years. The decisions we make today will affect those who inherit our choices long into the future. Perhaps there are other options to consider and explore. Small, clean, green cottage industries and small startups that could provide profitable goods and services that also contribute to our tax base. Ojai's compact and rather isolated geographic makeup may offer another exciting option. Ojai is poised to be a model community and always has been if we so choose. It is a small enough area with the leadership and skill sets to actively implement the most ancient and modern approaches to water management, land management, education, traffic flow, housing, energy generation and consumption, public transportation, public arts, intergenerational exchange. All of these contribute to an economic base. It seems apparent that for the hey, last... You're, you're just about, <laughs> your, your time has come. <laughs> you want me to stop? Three sentences. Three sentences. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. No, we don't bank the time, but go ahead, get your three sentences. I'm sorry I interrupted you. It seems apparent that for the last 30 years, possibly more, Ohio has focused more energy and resources on tourism rather than creating the cleanest, healthiest, and most vibrant ecology possible for Ohio's residents. And though there needs, there's renewed and serious interest in more holistically inspired, cleaner, and greener way of life, we seem to be having our focus elsewhere. Are we running the risk of creating a future wrought with damage control scenarios? It's not a this or that choice, but must be a this and that when it comes to promoting the tourism industry. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. And I don't know if I have all the cards, but my last card I have right now is Michael Haley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council, fellow citizens. I'm Michael Haley. I live on Kanawha Street. My comment is that in no other business would you adopt a half million, million dollar advertising budget without knowing what kind of customers you intend to attract, whether you have the capacity to serve them. If you went to any chamber of commerce in this country and presented that kind of plan, uh, they would laugh you out the door. You couldn't do a business that way. Yet that's exactly what our chamber is asking us to do. Spend half a million dollars a year with no traffic study, no idea of how much water it will use, how many visitors it will generate, and whether we have those resources available to handle it. Um, we're, and yet we're asked to commit to a 10-year plan without knowing any of that. And I think that's folly. If Ojai is going to move into the big leagues of mass advertising budgets, which this is, it's a big budget, New York Times articles, related levels of feature articles in a constant social media branding campaign, then Ojai also needs to move into the big leagues of planning for traffic, water, housing, and the general impacts on the community. To not do so is a recipe for disaster. No other place would even consider doing this kind of advertising without planning for the impacts. Uh, take the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa. They've, they've raised their accommodation levels, but they spend a lot of money planning for it. They're organized around it. They're constantly in motion. They're constantly changing the situation. Um, and they do a lot of planning, and that's because they're a smart, well-run, professional organization. Are we going to handle this like amateurs? Are we going to just pass a ra apparently random number for advertising and sit back and see what happens? We don't know what's going to happen with this. Um, so what I'm advocating for is professional traffic engineer to really study this. How, look how we're making this decision. It's a bunch of people like me, who's not a professional, coming up and giving their opinions. Well, that's not really going to help anything. We're just going back and forth from one side to the other. Um, so we do, absolutely do need to have an independent, objective traffic study from professional traffic people before I think we should even consider uh, passing this plan. Um, 
Another issue that this, the current city council members ought to take into account is that there's a sleeping giant of voters out there who haven't yet tuned into this issue. Um, I get this from my neighborhood. I talk to all my neighbors. Um, the truth is that Ojai is not primarily a tourist town. Yes, we have tourism, but most of the economic base in Ojai comes from people who commute to work in Ventura, Santa Barbara, and other nearby cities. Ojai is a bedroom community, a suburb, if you will. That's the economic base of Ojai. There's 200 unemployed people in Ojai. That's it. Uh, unemployment in Ventura County is lower than 5%. If this OTID causes a big increase in traffic during commute times, you can bet those people are gonna be unhappy because they're gonna be sitting in their cars even more than they are right now. Um, and then they're gonna find out how did this happen. It's because the city council passed this OTID. And, and you know, I just wouldn't wanna face that myself in the next election. Thank you. Okay. Is this on this item or another yes. item? It's for this item. For this item? Yes. Okay. Uh, Marissa. Marissa. Yes. Okay, Marissa, you're up. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I am completely unprepared, so I will probably speak <laughs> um, not very clearly, but I wanted to come out. It's pretty rare for me to come out. I've been a resident of Ojai for 23 years. I raised my son here um, <coughs> with Aka. Um, can you go a little closer so we can hear you? Thank you. Yeah. So many things have been said here quite articulately. Um, one of the things I want to um, emphasize is the more that we take care of our families, the better Ojai will be. It's like so. It's like I question what, what do we need in the perma, in the realm of permaculture? People care. People care is one of the tenets. There's um, the longer that we're able to stay in, stay in a place. We the more we know the environment, the more we know our people. We I love. I'm just gonna ramble. Um, I love that we've had many generations of families that have been in this in 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 Ojai and we're losing that um, and as one who is um, an advocate for families I really want to bring this on the table as well in terms of in light of the subject is what can we do for our families um, there was also mention of gathering together our community, various community members. There's a process called open, open space technology. It's an incredible process that doesn't need much planning, but it pulls together the resources and the insights of the community members in terms of what is important to them. Can you speak a little louder, Marissa, or come closer, one or the other? Is that better? it's important what you're saying. We want to hear you. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. So. There's a process called open space technology that allows um, people of different um, um, perspectives to come together and talk about what's important to them and to create a plan. It's a, an agenda from the inside out. And so I want to also uh, just suggest that as something to look into as other possible ways of figuring out how to diversify. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Can I ask a question, Marissa? Yes. I, I was a little bit confused about this process. Is this a process, what I'm feeling very much is that we need a process where the different viewpoints in the community, you know, can come together for the greater yes. good. A process where we're not vilifying each, each other, yep. where we really take time to understand each other's perspective. Is that what you're yes. speaking about? Yes, it's an amazing process for that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, that I believe we're all. Is there anybody I missed? And maybe I have a card here. I just didn't find it. If not, then that will conclude this particular discussion. The, the, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, I can happy to be answer the question posed by Councilmember Francina earlier. Okay. Which is that disestablishment of a oh, tourism improvement district is governed by Streets and Highways Code Section three six six seven zero. Short answer is. The council has the power to dissolve the district, stop the assessment once it's imposed, but under certain conditions. First, there could be no outstanding unpaid debt. As I understand the management plan, they're not proposing to issue any bonds, so that probably wouldn't be triggered. 
Second, the council has to find, after notice of intent to dissolve, then a hearing, and then a final resolution of dissolution, one of three things, misappropriation of funds, malfeasance, or violation of law in connection with the management of the district. It has to be on those basis for the council to dissolve the district. Every year there is a 30-day protest period in which the assessed entities may also dissolve the district by majority protest. Does that answer the question? Well, <coughs> uh, in part. In, in other words, um, if we had traffic gridlock, that would not be a reason to stop the assessment. Correct. Traffic gridlock alone would not be a sufficient reason okay. to, under or the law to stop the assessment. Uh, reason that would, you any know, quality of life yeah. type reason would not qualify. It would have to be uh, malfeasance, misappropriation, fraud, theft, something like that. Okay. Some error of law or judgment in running the district. Okay. And I believe the city manager may have a further question. Or I'm reading that wrong. If I could just add one more comment, which I think was also part of your question, was in terms of the, the rate, mm -hmm. once it's approved by council, our understanding is that the, the council sets the range of the rates, and then it is the, uh, the yes. board of the district yes. that would yes. be able to increase or decrease that. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. So it's not, no longer in our hands. Thank yes. You. Once the council sets the range, which is proposed between 1% and 2%, then that stands unless the council finds malfeasance or fraud or okay. other issue. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Summers, it was my understanding that before there could be a rate increase that the district would have to come back before us. That's not the case? That is not correct. The council, ha the council sets the max at 2%, but the increases in the range presently proposed to go up to 1.5% as of January 1st, 2018. The re increases after that from 1.5 to 2 are controlled solely by the owner's board. Okay. Okay. Are there other questions on this topic? Uh, I just have one comment on it. I'm just um, I'm surprised to hear it this way. Um, I wonder if, if the, uh, the original okay. count. That's not true. Just, just, just a minute. Okay. Just well, I'll call on you, Scott. Just drink. Well, all I'm trying to say is, is I'm just, um, you know, what I just heard is once this TBID was put in place that it can't be stopped other than by the cons other than by the users of it um, and I was just wondering if the previous council even understood that when they initiated this that uh, that's a concern to me that the council doesn't have um, the right to resend this um, I don't know what do we want to call it this law or this ordinance and it just it, that that concerns me Okay. That's I'm, a concern. I'm going to allow Scott to make a comment, but not to get into a debate over the law. No. The, okay. Any rate increase that we ask for has to come before the council. And the council has to agree to that before it can be granted. That's the way it was explained to me five years ago, and that's the way it was explained to me just this afternoon when I question Civitas, the group that does probably 90% okay. of these things. So okay, we will that's my we, understanding is okay. so that we have to come to you if we want to increase our rate okay. of assessment. We, we will definitely <laughs> look into that and have a firm answer, which I believe we do With have respect by, by, the, by the time the public hearing is held. Absolutely, we'll, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and to the last point to add is that if that is the wish of the council, the rule that is um, under debate is built into the management plan not the law. The council has the power to force that increases within that rate range be approved by council. As presently proposed is not the case, but you have the power to force that. You do not have the power, though, to reserve the right to uh, dissolve the district in the interest of anything other than malfeasance or fraud or similar. Okay. Yeah. With that, uh, we will conclude this item, and I'm going to take a five-minute recess uh, in case anyone <laughs> needs a recess and then we will come back together for our public hearing. <laughs>
Uh, those of you who want to participate, otherwise, uh, bon voyage. See you. See you next time. <laughs> Okay, we've. Uh, it was. Some interesting points raised. The rent increase. Okay, our our next item on the agenda is a public hearing, uh, and I'm going to have the. Uh, where is our city manager? Are you ready? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Let's wait for uh, Randy since we don't have. No. <laughs> <laughs> you wait till me. <laughs> wait until he's, I call the meeting back into session. <laughs> Okay, we're back in session. We have a, we have a quorum. Uh, staff, you have a reporter speaker. Am I not on? Oh, there I'm on. Okay, we are, I'm calling uh, the public hearing into, or opening the public hearing, I guess is what I'm doing, and the staff will give their report, and we will then proceed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Kathleen Wold, our community development director, will be giving the staff report. Kathleen? Thank you. Before you tonight is consideration of an appeal, the Planning Commission's denial of design review permit DRP 1601 for modification to the design review permit DRP 1309 for construction of a second story addition and remodel to a single family residence at 601 Crestview. And um, as I just read into the record, this is an appeal. And in the executive summary, we give you an overview of what the issues were and how the Planning Commission um, took action. And a particular concern was just the overall changes in the design, including c colors and stark transition away from an initially approved Craftsman ar architecture. Also of concern was um, the two walls in the front yard, particularly the one that had been existing, but then a second stem wall that was um, presented by the applicant subsequent <coughs> Um, to the first one and with that we just provide you um, a basic project description and the appeal procedures and then in your in your staff report um, we've gone through each one of the grounds that was provided by the applicant and given you staff's analysis of that um, of their appeal grounds and I can read those if you want but I'm trying to keep this brief for you and um, with that we would just like to point out that the resolution prepared for you tonight is upholding the Planning Commission's denial of the um, of the DRP permit. And as we like to always explain with the denial, there's two types of denials you can do. One is a without prejudice and one's with prejudice. Without prejudice would allow the applicant to come back right away if they wanted to and apply for a DRP with some changes that maybe if the council took if that was the direction the council wanted to go tonight, they could provide some direction and um, um, for the applicant and what needs to be modified for them to come back through for a DRP. If the um, city council chooses to um, not go with a denial, then you would need to direct staff to come back with a different resolution for you tonight. So as I said, the resolution before you tonight just talks about denial. We would like you, if you do adopt that tonight, to deny it without prejudice prejudice, excuse me, so that the applicant can come right back in without waiting a year. Okay. Uh, are we at the point of having the, <coughs> the applicant uh, address the council? Good evening, Mayor Johnston and members of the council. My name is Neil McGuire. I'm an attorney with Ferguson Case or Patterson in Ventura, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the project applicant, Ernie Roydy, who is in the audience. Uh, we also have with us our project team, our architect and contractor, uh, to answer any specific questions that may arise from the council. Uh, I think everybody, I see them on the dais up there. Uh, I did provide uh, the council members and staff with a copy of a uh, package of material for this evening's discussion 
Uh, I do plan to reference this, and you'll hear me occasionally refer to slide numbers that are found in the upper right-hand corner uh, of this presentation, with the exception of the cover page and then some of the inserted materials. Uh, so if I refer to a slide, uh, again, it'll be, <coughs> excuse me, the upper right-hand uh, corner. So. Uh, before I get into the weeds here, uh, there is a unique procedural history with regard to this project, and so I want to give just a brief overview of uh, that history and uh, I think summarize those, uh, those issues and the key questions here um, because it does impact uh, what, uh, what we believe is the proper scope of the 2016 DRP application uh, as well as this appeal. So. Again, I think it's, uh, looking at slide two, it's, it's important to, to focus on what were the existing conditions uh, prior to 2013 for this home? Uh, what was done in 2013 with regard to the approval of the DRP at that point in time? And then uh, again, in turn, uh, what are the uh, consistency issues that are before us? What, what really should be, for, be before the city uh, this evening? So moving to uh, slides three through five, I'd like to start uh, with, again, a, a few uh, depictions of what existed uh, really prior to 2013, uh, prior to the remodel, prior to the prior uh, DRP application. Uh, and you can see uh, here uh, that uh, there's an existing two-story home, uh, that there is a, a mass and size and scale of this home uh, that again existed uh, in 2013 prior to the remodel. Uh, the second story, the balcony, the overall massing of the home is depicted here. Uh, and I wanted to start with this because when I went back and looked at the Planning Commission uh, proceeding, and there were several, but uh, the primary one in particular, there were a lot of questions and comments that focused on the size and the massing of the home. And there were a lot of comments that, uh, frankly, it didn't seem very clear to me uh, that there was a clear, consistent approach uh, upon the dais as to what uh, had been done uh, in 2013 uh, and what had previously existed. So again, uh, as we'll get to in a few minutes, you can see from the slide presentation that the existing front yard elevation existed well before uh, the 2013 DRP and, and the remodel. Uh, so uh, turning to slide six, uh, I have a brief summary of the items that were then uh, approved in 2013 with that DRP. So we have a first floor addition, a garage addition, a second story addition, balcony space. We have a new garden wall in the front yard that we'll get to in more detail in a few moments. <coughs> and then we had a color palette and a uh, craftsman style that was approved in 2013. Can we ask, uh, I, I, I can't understand these slides because it looks like there's this huge wall here and now it looks like a small wall. So I'm sorry, Councilwoman. So you're comparing slides three, four, and five here? That's existing. That was already there. Yeah, more yeah, more yeah, yeah, yeah. So but I'm saying that, <coughs> that these two pictures look so different. Yeah. They're different so angles, but there's a different perspective. See how the yeah. wall's lower here, higher here, because that street runs downhill. So okay. the wall, the so wall is lower in height by the driveway, which I think you can see in slide four so most clearly. I, I went to the house twice, so okay. I'm familiar with it. Okay. I'm just confused about the, the photographs, yep. the angle of the, why it looks so high in one place and so low in the other. I guess okay. it's, it's all that's about perspective. <laughs> that's the issue, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. okay. yes. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. for the interruption. Nope, uh, certainly. Uh, so moving on, as I noted in slide uh, seven here, uh, again, this is, a, I think, an important point that when uh, the DRP was presented and approved in 2013, there was a finding at that time by the city uh, that the overall mass of the residential structure uh, at that point, given the changes that were proposed in the 2013 DRP, uh, that the overall massing would be preserved. And that's because that the changes uh, that were sought at that time were primarily uh, focused on either an internal or uh, an internal feature of the home or an item that's in uh, uh, the backyard, so a rear balcony, for example. 
Um, and so we do have the administrative report uh, making that note that there wasn't a substantial increase in massing at that point in time. So bringing us to the present day, uh, city staff has identified, as we heard this evening, several areas where uh, staff contends that the as-built condition uh, of the home right now is not consistent with the 2013 approvals from the city. So I tried to summarize those uh, in slide eight, and I do intend to take these in order uh, this evening. So importantly, we do recognize that there are items that do require additional review and approval by the city, um, but we do believe that there are certain items that should not require uh, any further action from the city and are beyond the scope of uh, a new DRP modification requirement, and I'd like to start with those. So for example, uh, the home's roof uh, has been approved by the community development director and also by the planning commissioner, by, by the planning commission, excuse me, as detailed in slide nine. So the original roof here was, uh, there was a color palette that had a, a color set aside for the roof. Uh, when uh, our contractor went to uh, put the roof on, we was informed that that color was no longer available. And so uh, ultimately uh, new colors close to the original uh, were presented to city staff. Uh, the community development director did select a new color for the roof. Uh, I've included the email uh, confirming that uh, behind slide nine. Uh, the planning commission in November, uh, the second to last hearing and also the last hearing reaffirmed those approvals and the, the planning commission's resolutions do carve out uh, the roof color as well as the roof line as uh, being approved. So uh, we understand at this point that uh, this appeal does not encompass, does not need to encompass uh, either the roof color or the roof line. Uh, the garden wall, what we refer to as the garden wall, is certainly a different story. Uh, so our position explained in slide 10 uh, is essentially that the wall was uh, presented and approved in 2013. Uh, we constructed the wall in reliance on that approval, and uh, we believe that no further action is required from the city in order to maintain that wall. Uh, city staff, as you can see on slide 11, uh, does not believe that the garden wall was previously approved or that it was uh, adequately approved. And they've offered several grounds for that in the administrative report. And so I would like to take those in order and, and with some detail as this issue is very, very important uh, to us in order to preserve uh, that garden wall. So first, uh, staff contends that the applicant uh, did not adequately disclose the garden wall in the 2013 entitlement proceeding. Uh, so I uh, saw that concern and I went back to the city's files from 2013 and uh, I'll go through here. Obviously, I feel that there was more than adequate uh, disclosure of, of the plans here. Uh, so first, uh, for example, uh, the site plan, excuse me, that was submitted to the city in the summer of 2013 uh, is behind slide 12, and it's a pullout. I've highlighted in yellow on that site plan the note that refers to the new garden wall. And as you can see, and this is still a reduced version here, uh, that note is legible. It's the same font and size of the other notes. And it clearly refers to a new three foot high, uh, again, what we are referring to as a garden wall. Uh, second, city staff and the applicant's architect exchanged letters uh, seeking clarification regarding the height of that garden wall. Those letters are also, copies of those letters are also provided behind slide 12. And I've highlighted the portions that refer to the garden wall. And then third, and this one is particularly important, the city staff report from 2013 described the project. Obviously there's a project narrative, a project description. And included in that is a discussion of the garden wall. And so that report stated, quote, a new plaster garden wall is proposed within the front yard setback. However, this wall will not exceed the three foot height limitation established in table 3-3 of the municipal code. And then lastly, uh, 
uh, I was not involved, but our applicant team presented a PowerPoint presentation in 2013 to the Planning Commission that summarized the components of the project. And that included a reference to the new garden wall. And that slide from that PowerPoint presentation is also included in your packets. And I've highlighted again the, the specific reference to the uh, garden wall reference. And that PowerPoint includes a reference to the, the new garden wall and also uh, the retention of the existing uh, wall. So again, looking at these materials, which all came from the city's uh, files, we believe that there was more than adequate disclosure of the fact that in 2013 we were asking for a new garden wall. Obviously, the site plan was approved in 2013. Uh, and again, it's our view that uh, there's no further action that's required from the city in order to uh, keep that garden wall. I want to also address the statement in the administrative report that contends that the city, um, because of these past inadequate disclosures, has never really been able to adequate, excuse me, adequately analyze whether the garden wall is consistent with the city's municipal code. Uh, as you can tell from the language that I just read a few moments ago, uh, that's not true. The 2013 report expressly stated that the wall was consistent with the code. There's specific reference uh, to the section in the code, to the table in the code that provides the height limitations. Uh, so that reference uh, was, was included in that report and the analysis was done. Uh, I also wanted to note that the resolution that was adopted by the Planning Commission in 2013, which is Resolution 13-16, uh, included a statement indicating that the site plan and the other materials that were provided with the DRP application, quote, include sufficient information as to assure compatibility with the surrounding area, unquote, and the goals and policies of the city. And that resolution, that excerpt right there can be found at page 2-31 of your administrative report. So again, we have the city saying, we've got sufficient information, we've looked at the wall, we understand that's part of the project, and we've analyzed it against the code, and we believe that it's consistent with the municipal code. So I also want to, to next address then uh, the, uh, I think maybe relatively newfound position uh, from, uh, that's found in the administrative report that when you have multiple walls in a front setback area, that you have to cumulatively uh, analyze the height of those walls. So for example, if you have a four foot wall and a three foot wall, you really have a seven foot wall, I think is, is, the, is that position. Um, first of all, there's no, uh, excuse me, uh, I wanna note uh, as I do on slide 13, uh, that city staff in a prior report in, for this project, uh, and that excerpt is attached behind slide 13, stated that the city, unlike some other jurisdictions, has, quote, no standards for how to measure stacked walls. So this is not some type of express policy that the city has uh, uh, or, or a policy found in guidelines uh, that requires that, that cumulative height analysis uh, of the walls. I think actually when you look at the municipal code provisions that deal with walls, fences, and retaining walls, you see exactly the opposite. You see the, a contemplation in those code provisions that there will be stacked walls uh, at times. And, and again, all of them are subject to the three foot height limitation. Uh, so again, I don't think there's any, uh, there's certainly no provision in the municipal code that speaks to this. Uh, and it certainly wasn't the interpretation of the code that was applied by the city in 2013. So we did construct the wall. It was constructed at three foot three feet from the top of the existing uh, wall and grade there. We did not import any fill to raise uh, the, the elevation of the front yard that would allow us to then in turn uh, raise the height of the wall. Uh, and I don't know if you were able to see this in any uh, site visits, but uh, if you go behind the wall, there's a little bit of landscaping and then there's essentially a patio uh, back there. So it's not a, it, it, it's important to note that, it, I mean, we refer to it as a garden wall. 
it's not a stem wall, it's not a retaining wall, it doesn't serve a structural purpose or a foundational pur purpose. Uh, it really is to delineate the front uh, patio, and, and there is some patio furniture uh, in the front there as well. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Mayor, um, before we move on, could I ask the applicant sure. a question? <clears throat> I'm a little confused at this wall. You have highlighted on your pullout sheet, it says proposed three foot high site wall with plaster finish, and it, and it looks as though the call out goes somewhere down just on the inside of the, the uh, sidewalk. And then if you go down from there, there's another call out <coughs> that says propose three foot high site wall with plaster finish. And it looks like it's referring to the wall that is the white wall here. Is that correct? That is not correct. That, okay. that is a separate reference. And so the reference to okay. the- Well, where's the reference to this wall? So if you look below the, the highlighted portion that I have provided, yeah. below that there is a separate note that says existing four foot high retaining wall at back of walk. So that is the white wall that existed prior to 2013. And, and I believe as stated at the planning commission meeting that that wall was constructed in the 1960s. Okay. I think the building permit for that is in the 60s. All right. So. <clears throat> I'm still a little confused as to this, the call out with the line as to where that line goes. It doesn't look to me as though it goes all the way back to where the patio is delineated. Looks to me like it's much forward of that because it looks like there's some sort of a fountain. Is there a fountain between the- There's landscaping. Landscaping, and it says landscaping, yep. but it looks like that wall is all the way back in this general area here. Well, is that, is that correct? No, it's it's not very far back in the front yard. Uh, it's not as far back as as this. No, and I don't know if it would be helpful. Maybe uh, you have a bigger blueprint. We yeah, we for do. Site plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Each council member should take the opportunity to view the map. The same map provided by the applicant is let the record reflect that. And any council members wishing to make comments must make them on the microphone so that all can hear. Thank you. And while that's being reviewed, I, I just confirmed that the uh, as-built horizontal distance between the two walls is approximately three feet. So am I correct that this area in the front that looks like it's landscaped, that is the depiction in uh, this <coughs> photograph of the area between the two walls? Yes, this Councilman. Here? Yes, Councilman Blatt. Okay. Does anyone else want to look at the? No. I no. Okay. <coughs> All right. I would, I would like to interject something, though I don't know if, it, uh, if I should have done it before we started the discussion, but I believe um, I did visit the site and I did meet with, um, with the city, with their attorney, so I just wanted to put that publicly out there um, prior to um, this discussion tonight. So I just want to make sure that that's on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> you want to know if we visited the site? Because I visited the site twice. Y yes, the council members that visited the site should note that for the record. Yes, I visited twice. I spent considerable time in both from both directions. You know, went Crestview, you know, the way it goes. Right. I didn't visit the site prior to this appeal, but it seems to me that this project was before either the council or the planning commission at one point in time. Did it come before the council? In 2013? I do not believe so, but I'd ask the director to confirm. Not that I'm aware of. I'm sorry, not that I'm aware of. Then I'm not sure what the site visit I did. It wasn't recently. It was 
a few years ago. It's come before the planning commission a few times, so maybe in one of those prior it times. Might have been for that then. Yeah. <coughs> um, so, bringing us back to slide 14, again, I think it's uh, clear from the materials in the city's files that, again, the garden wall was disclosed. It was analyzed for land use consistency purposes. And again, our view is that no further action from the city is required. <coughs> and we do not need a DRP modification for the garden wall. Uh, so I'd like to turn now to, I think, what was the next uh, key issue for the Planning Commission. Uh, I think we heard it again from uh, staff this evening. Uh, the key issue besides the garden wall, which really was the color of the home. Uh, as noted at slide 15 and immediately behind it, uh, there was a color palette for the home that was approved in 2013 and that color palette was made part of the DRP approval resolution itself. Uh, and that can be found at page 2-42 of your administrative report. Uh, I've also included a copy of the color palette, <coughs> excuse me, uh, behind slide 15. Uh, that, that copy comes from the city's files. Uh, I know that there was a discussion at Planning Commission that uh, depending on who printed <laughs> the color palette, uh, it may uh, look different. Uh, there may be some slight variations there. Um, that did come from the, a copy from the city's files. So as you can see, the color palette uh, shows that the front of the home was intended to be a yellow, even orangish tone. Uh, and there are references there to uh, various portions of the home uh, with regard to the different colors, some of those colors up above are trim colors, um, but the yellow and orangish color below, or uh, right above the rock, uh, is what was intended to be for the front of the home. Uh, unfortunately, there was a rendering prepared for the project uh, that illustrates a different color tone, and that rendering uh, I've included in the presentation at slide 16. I think it was also in your administrative report as well, and I say unfortunately because really that rendering, which I think was very nicely done, uh, but it does seem to present a different color tone, and I think it's that rendering and not the color palette uh, that seems to have established the expectations here as to what the home would look like, not just from a style perspective, which we'll get to, um, but from a, a color perspective. And that should have been uh, avoided in 2013, uh, certainly. Um, but putting that aside, I'd like to get back to the color palette, uh, which again is what was actually approved in 2013 and made part of the DRP approval. Uh, and again, you can see that the existing of the uh, color of the home, uh, which is on the front of the PowerPoint presentation, uh, is, uh, is not so far away, if at all, from what was depicted on the color palette. And that was noted by uh, a couple of the planning commissioners that obviously if you look at the rendering, you get a different idea, but if you look at the color palette, uh, it does envision that yellowish, orangish tone. So what I'd like to do is focus on whether that color, uh, what's, what's there existing now, uh, is compatible with the neighborhood community. Obviously, that goes to the findings that are required for the DRP. Uh, and we took a look around and, and believe that that color is, in fact, compatible with uh, the uh, immediate neighborhood. So at slide 17, what I've done is included a map uh, that illustrates the location of several homes in the immediate uh, neighborhood. And what I wanted to do was to show you that we did not go through the city of Ojai and cherry pick uh, various homes that were similar to this one. Uh, all of these are within a stone's throw of the project site. So at slide 18, we have a lime, lime green home uh, at 314 Santa Ana, which is right before the curve to Crestview. Across the street from that home, that's depicted at slides 19 and 20, uh, we have a, a you know, fairly bold yellow uh, residence. Uh, and then finally, there is another yellow home on Crestview itself at slide 21. And again, on slide 17, all of these are shown in, in stars. So I have some more examples of homes from the neighborhood uh, later on in the presentation that go to the style and the overall design of the home and, and the compatibility 
issues there. And there's a variety of colors that are depicted in that neighborhood. Uh, but I think that these examples show that uh, a yellow home, like the one that we have at uh, our site, uh, is certainly compatible with the neighborhood. And I think that's demonstrated uh, in part by the fact that we did get uh, supporting comment letters from two of the neighbors, uh, and those are included later in the packet uh, as well. So beyond the color of the home, uh, it did not appear that the Planning Commission objected to the overall style or the overall design of the home. Um, that is, the absence of a craftsman style, which was certainly contemplated in the 2013 DRP. We, we recognize that. Um, but the absence of that style really did not seem to uh, be driving the Planning Commission's decision, as the commissioners did seem to recognize that there were numerous styles in the neighborhood. Uh, but I do want to address the issue, uh, and I do so beginning at slide 22, uh, because it is, continued, it is addressed in the administrative report. Uh, so you, as you can see in slide 22, there are design elements uh, for the home that were approved in 2013 and have been modified. We do recognize that there's uh, modifications to the DRP uh, that required, required to account for these changes. Uh, I did want to note with regard to the listings on slide 22 that uh, there is stone on the front of the home, as you can see. It, it's not uh, necessarily quite in the location that was uh, depicted in 2013, but uh, the garage and the front door uh, and the second story does have some stone trim uh, on it. So that, that element is, pr is present, uh, but not uh, in quite the same fashion as uh, envisioned in 2013. Uh, so I think the initial item that I've got on slide 22 is, is really, you know, maybe what was the most important one and, and seemed to have been driving some of the other changes, uh, which is that the front of the home primarily uses plaster with the exception of those stone elements and not wood siding. I've included a letter behind slide 22 uh, from the project architect from last spring to city staff uh, that explains that the wood siding could not be utilized after all because of extensive uh, wood rot. Um, so the decision was made to use uh, plaster which was consistent with uh, what was utilized on the side and the rear of the home. So again, we're facing uh, compatibility issues here, I think, with regard to the findings that uh, the city has to make uh, to approve this. And so starting at slide 23, uh, we've included illustrations of other homes in the neighborhood. Again, I think the primary point here is that uh, in the immediate neighborhood, there is not a consistent style, craftsman or otherwise, uh, that dominates. And there's a, a fairly wide variety. I think there's one other you know, true craftsman home um, but there really is a wide variety of architectural styles uh, in that neighborhood. I wanted to note too that you can look at some of the homes that are depicted on slides 23, 24, and 26, and you can see that those have uh, pretty similar massing and overall size as uh, our uh, project home. Certainly there are some examples in the neighborhood to the contrary. There are some very uh, smaller homes. I think you can look at slide 28. Uh, and see a few examples of those. Uh, but again, you know, we think looking at the neighborhood uh, and looking at these examples that what exists at 601 Crestview is not uh, out of character for the neighborhood. <coughs> and again, I wanted to mention we did get uh, two comment letters from neighbors that I've included behind slide 29 that are supportive of the project, very complimentary of the work that was done on the home. Uh, and I've included them here because it did not appear that they were included in your administrative report. We did obviously see a comment in the uh, council that was prepared, or excuse me, the package that was prepared for council uh, that objected to portions of the project. Uh, and one specific comment from Ms. Newman uh, focused on the visibility of a gas meter on the si side of the home. I wanted to note that we've included new landscaping uh, to address that comment, and that's shown at slide 30. So we, 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 we might disagree uh, with regard to the overall uh, nature of those comments, but we did want to try to be uh, as good a neighbor as possible and as responsive as possible to that comment. So 
that new landscaping has already been added uh, within the last couple of weeks here. Uh, the last item that was referenced in the administrative report with regard to the consistency issues is a cabana structure that uh, it would be located in, or is located in the home's uh, uh, backyard. Uh, at the Planning Commission proceeding, uh, the, there was originally a, a motion and then an amendment to a motion uh, that would have uh, approved that structure, just like the, the roof and the roof line uh, had been previously approved. Uh, then there was a very lengthy discussion about what that would require from a uh, findings and resolutions perspective. Uh, and so that amendment was withdrawn. I, I, I view that as the Planning Commission understanding that in all likelihood uh, their action was going to require uh, the applicant to come back with another uh, proposed plan and the cabana could be approved at that point in time. I did not hear any objections to that structure. It's in the rear of the home. Uh, so I'm not going to address it in detail. I did want to acknowledge it. And if there are any questions, we can, uh, we can address those. So uh, in conclusion, we certainly recognize that there are items here uh, that will require a modification to the, to the 2013 DRP. Um, but those items do not include the roof and they do not include the garden wall. Uh, so we also believe that the color of the home and the overall style of the home are compatible with the neighborhood. Uh, we'd appreciate the council's direction on those issues. Uh, we'd appreciate the uh, grant of our uh, appeal. We thank you for your time and your consideration. And as I mentioned, we do have a project team here if there are any questions. So thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. Are there any questions? I have, I have com comments, maybe questions. Uh, but does, does Kathleen, does she respond before I make comments, or how does that work? Because it's my first appeal. Well, so, I, do you, do you staff want to, has made their presentation, you, made so your, I assume they'd like to respond to what comments and questions, if uh, you have some. That would be reasonable. You may also see if there's any other speakers. I don't know if there are. Take them yeah, first. Pardon me. Yeah, let's any. see. We may, do we have any other? And then you could close the public comment portion. Then staff could respond to the council's questions and to the points raised by Mr. McGuire. What was the last part of that, Matt? Do you <laughs> close what? After any other speakers that are <laughs> present speak, you could close the public hearing. Um, then the staff could respond to the issues raised and to the council members' what questions. What about questions of the applicant? Do we oh, you, well, you could ask those as well. After the, uh, well, you'd have to reopen the public hearing. So if you have questions of the applicant, not of staff, you may ask those now. If we now. have questions of the applicant right now, that we <laughs> if we do, we that would know. be a good time. I, I don't know yet. So let's just okay, keep the public. Okay, let me ask, are there, are there other people in the audience that wish to address this item? Okay, I don't hear any or see any hands. All right, Paul? Yes, I just, uh, so that I can get my uh, mind around this. You came before the Planning Commission in 2013 with the design and the uh, and with the the request that the building look a particular way and then it was built and it was built substantially Change. different than what was envisioned when you came with the first DRP is that correct I, I think we might quibble about substantially okay. different. But it was but built differently. There are, we recognize there are items that are different than what was approved okay. in 2013. And those include the columns and, and uh, things like that? Yes, Councilman. Okay. So what you're, what you're really here for is to say that, yes, you acknowledge it was built differently and you're coming back to ask for permission to allow it to be left that way but that you, we shouldn't have to concern ourselves with that second wall, for one, because that was anticipated in the initial Co design. Correct. And we shouldn't have to concern ourselves with the color because that was disclosed and anticipated at the initial 2013 approval. And we shouldn't have to concern ourselves with the roof. Is that correct? I think that's an accurate summary. Yes, okay. Councilman. And then the other things, and that's still up for debate as far as staff is concerned. Understood. But then what are the, what are the areas of the design that were built that do need our attention because they were built differently? So I think uh, we are then looking at the design elements, which really are, so it's, it's the columns that uh, are now uh, plaster columns and do not have stone. 
Uh, there's wrought iron that was used uh, instead of the approved material. Um, uh, the stone location in the front of the home is different than what was envisioned uh, in 2013 as well. And if you give me a moment here, let me just check my list so I can accurately list all of these. <coughs> is it on page 22? Uh, I'm on page slide 8, but... Page 22 is the yes. design elements, There's revisions to elements approved in 2013. Yes. So we have a, a uh, plaster versus wood siding in the front, columns or plaster instead of stone and steel, uh, plaster porch instead of wood siding, stone veneer additions were not included. Again, there is stone on the front of the home in other locations, uh, and the railing was changed from stainless steel to wrought iron. Okay. Now, slide number 16 that says rendering provided in 2013. <coughs> Forgetting about the color at this point, was that the rendering that was approved by the Planning Commission? I don't know the if that's- The design. Yes, it was. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you speaking to me. So as built would be as shown, as reflected on the cover sheet. Yes, Councilman. Okay. So I have, and if I could just address, <laughs> the rendering was certainly provided in the 2013 Planning Commission proceedings. And again, I acknowledge that it certainly set expectations here. I don't believe it was part of the formal DRP approval. Okay, thank you. I don't have anything further right okay. now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Paul. Should, I go, should I go ahead? Yeah, go. Well, I, I have to say that I like the new design better <laughs> than the original. And I did not realize that it was so massive already originally. And, you know, I have uh, some notes, but I first look, came around, uh, you know, from the left, you know, the, you know, I went in one, the, I don't know how to explain the direction, so I pointed this way, and I admit I was startled, you know, you could, it's different, it's very different, but it's a very beautiful, unique neighborhood, it's an incredible neighborhood with a lot of unique houses. So I thought, hmm, you know, then I went and I read the report and I saw the validity. I, 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 full disclosure, I spoke to one of the commissioners, you know, I just did a little research. Then I decided to go back <clears throat> from the other direction about a, a two hours later, and I immediately saw that the house pretty much matched the neighbor to the, coming, facing this, to the right. And I thought it looked great. I thought the house looked great. I saw it with fresh eyes, you know, and I thought it was beautiful. And as far as these, the, uh, the walls go, <laughs> I don't think it's logical to do a cumulative, that doesn't seem logical to me, to cum cumulative, that logic. Plus, I cannot in good conscience oppose this because there's been some horrific walls installed in Ojai, it just feels like, you know, everybody knows about the wall at the, near the top of North Signal near Pratt Trail. You know, I, I just, um, so compared to things that have been approved in the past, and there's other examples, I can see that with maybe some vines hanging down, if you want to soften it, it would be so easy to soften it, the land, you know, the, uh, the and, front. And we did present uh, uh -huh. several options for landscaping improvements uh -huh. um, in front of the Planning Commission. They, they chose not to pursue those options. I do in my bag have uh, a sample of the, uh, the rendering that was provided to the Planning Commissioners. But, um, but there was uh, certainly an approach that was looking at uh, softening some of those concerns with landscaping. Yeah. And I like that you addressed the neighbor's issue with the gas meter. Um, I think that's a, that's about all. I you know I really have to say I I didn't go around the back or you know anything. I just looked at the front. So the cabana is a separate issue, correct? It's a separate issue. We um, it it, it should at the, be at the planning commission. <laughs> we yes, we think it is a separate issue. At the planning commission hearing, uh, there was some uncertainty as to whether the plans had actually been presented to the city. Um, they they have been. They may not have been in front of the commission that, that evening. They had seen them previously, I believe. Um, so we think that those could be acted upon by staff 
with the information that's been provided already. Yeah, my, my sense is that, you know, there's a process. We have a planning commission, and, and, and some things seem, didn't go right. But I think the end result, I, I really like it. You know, I think if the if the paint was the lighter palette, it wouldn't be probably an issue as much because mm -hmm. it would more be in keeping. Be more muted. But more muted. But it just so happens that I like that color. Okay. Well, so. <laughs> at, at this stage, let's go with questions, and then we'll close the hearing, and we can okay. discuss amongst ourselves. Okay. If, uh, are there other questions of the applicant? Are well, I just have one last thing. I, I just some. Um, uh, the the legibility of the garden wall is difficult but I do see it noted on here so and I do see it noted that there is an existing four-foot retaining wall so I think that's just important to recognize if the arrow isn't specifically to the dotted line where the wall is going to go um, that's an error in, in architectural but the idea that it's called out for it doesn't uh, it, you know to me just precludes the thought that it wasn't on so on this site plan so yeah, well, I also, and just okay, to, to add to that very briefly again it we had documents besides the site plan where that was referenced it was included in the staff report it was included in the presentation to the Planning Commission so um, I mean I I don't think this is what's driving this but but hopefully there isn't a concern that that there was some subterfuge there you know we we, we disclosed it certainly in our PowerPoint presentation front and center um, it was not the, the primary component of the, the, the DRP application at that point in time. So I could see how it wasn't the focus of attention, but, um, but besides the site plan, there were, were discussions in 2013 uh, about the existence of that. Okay. So, but I understand the concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, then I'm gonna close the hearing and we will take it under consideration, okay? The hearing is now closed. Uh, Discussion or a motion? We have a motion. Um, is it I? Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to see if staff has any response. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. So um, I think there's a little misunderstanding regarding the garden wall. The, the issue was that this was the elevation the Planning Commission saw and made their findings for approval as far as scale, massing, and it doesn't show the wall. And that's where the disconnect comes between the wall <coughs> being on a site plan it's difficult on a site plan where it's flat and a bird's eye view to see what it will look like now as you see the picture, the rendering you have now. <coughs> that's where the concern came was the massing of having one wall, another wall, and then all of it one color. So I think that that was where um, there could have been a better job between, you know, presenting this and not showing the massing of the wall or how far, how close it would be to the next one or the fact that then behind it would be filled in and um, with patio now like this. So I think that's where the planning commissioners felt this, this was substantially different from this and the issue of the wall came up because the majority, there were a few of them that were still on the commission that were there. Of course, I wasn't there in 2013, so I can't speak to it, but I think that was the issue with the wall was it's hard to make a massing determination when it's not shown. That was the issue. Okay, Kathleen, can, can I ask, Mayor, can I ask mm -hmm. you a question? Kathleen, if, um, if that wall had been presented in that rendering, mm -hmm. would you have been able to see the whole front of the facade of that structure? I, see, I think so, just like you can now. No, 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 on the, on the, uh, on the original rendering. So in other words, if I, if I took that rendering and put a three-inch wall across, uh, you know, a three-foot wall across the front of it, am I now allowed to see the bottom of these um, support um, columns I am I allowed to see the siding or any of the work that's going on behind it because I, th I think if the wall w had been presented mm -hmm. the question then would have been okay so what are we doing behind that wall because we can't really see it right so, but may so maybe they should have provided more elevation correct you know more more correct um, I mean this is what was provided we 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 obviously this was done before I came here we wouldn't take something like this to planning commission now or we would hope not to and then we we would make certainly we would critique it and say that this isn't enough for you you know for you to make a uh, decision on because this isn't truly an elevation this is as he stated in a uh, rendering but having said that that's that is what caused this conflict is that it wasn't shown 
they, when, they, when, it, when these p pictures were then presented to the Planning Commission of how they didn't build this, but they built this, built that, it was shocking to them. That's where it comes from. So with that also, you know, um, the change in the colors, you know, when you look at the color palette that was proposed, it's very clear that the lighter yellow is what the body of the, of the house was supposed to be, okay? I don't know if you have it there or not. Um, regardless of how this was got to this beige color, I have no idea, but it would have been a much softer color, but staff has, has presented that. I did a planning commission a number of times about the color palette. And so when it really comes down to it, the applicant and the planning commission weren't able, there were different versions of, um, of, of trying to soften the massing or limit the massing, adding more stone, and he tried a couple of different things of reducing the massing of the wall, this patio up here, adding stone to it. He tried a, different, another, a number of different um, presentations to get it to where they can get, could get, could get Consensus, sorry. Anyway, it just ne they ne never manifest itself that there was some um, consensus, but it is a true statement that they did offer different versions, different softening of the palette, um, the plant palette with some vines or additional stone or a change in this. Um, but what they didn't want to do and where the real stumbling block came was over the color. You know, they didn't want to paint it or soften the color, and Planning Commission just could not get over the overall massing that cre is created by that intense color. And that's where they kind of got to the point that then they didn't have a shared premise, and they just moved forward. And so with that, I think that it is true that um, the original roof color on the color palette or the material board was a mottled color. It had a light and a dark color. He indicated to me that he couldn't get that color anymore, so we kind of stood back and, you know, from afar, well, what, when, what happens when you stand far from a model cuddle color? And that's the one I chose, the one as close as I could get, because that's really all you can do when a manufacturer stops manufacturing a product. And the, there was some concern over the raised eyebrow here, and we worked that issue out in Planning Commission, um, and we were able to get the roof completed for the applicant because, of course, he was without, he just said the roof, the Tyvek or whatever was up there, and so Planning Commission did work through that, and that is true that that different elevation in the roof line um, is not really an issue at this point. We've, he's allowed, he's been allowed, what, is it all but the eyebrow that you completed? Or did you complete the whole thing? Okay, all of it. So we did come to compromise on some things. Roof color, the eyebrow, et cetera. Um, but we still, um, it still ended up being the overall massing and the color. If that kind of gives some, kind of willow it down to the issues? Well, I, 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 you know, it's interesting to me from a landscape perspective, in five years that house is going to change because the plant material is going to grow <coughs> in. I mean, it's just going to be different in five years. So yeah. um, it, it's, a, it's a hard one for me. I, I don't have any inclination to take down a, a three-foot garden wall. Um, was there a permit required to put that wall in? We, yeah, they, there is even a correction. I think that okay. the applicant so, just provided so, you. So again, we had the opportunity at that time to review that wall, and we allowed it to go through. Correct. It, so the whole permit was issued the way it was. I think the only issue was because it's coming back before the Planning Commission was it not being shown in the massing. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Summers, the, I, I, what I'm gleaning from this is that this matter went back before the Planning Commission, as many projects do, asking for forgiveness rather than permission. Correct. And sometimes, as I recall, having been on the Planning Commission for 10 years, we said, no, you're going to have to go back and change it to its original design. And we did that for residential structures, as well as the one in particular I can remember that took a lot of work was a, was a commercial structure, a hotel. And it was clear that what was built was clearly different than what had been approved. So the applicant is now coming back before the Planning Commission asking for the Planning Commission to approve this design under the original 
uh, design review permit, correct? Right. He's, he's applied to modify the original design review permit to approve this design and, as is noted, contends that pieces of the new, the new design are not actually new design, but rather were previously approved. And the Planning Commission denied that request. Correct. So it's With being the two exceptions of the, the eyebrow and the roof color. They did okay. approve those two. So it's come now before us to see whether we're willing to approve these changes based on the original design review permit rather than sending the applicant back to obtain a new design review permit. Correct? Correct. The question okay. before the council is, can you make the findings to approve a design review permit with this proposed design or not? Okay. And, and is it, so is it a modified design review permit that we're, we're asked to either approve or deny? Correct. Okay. And what's the criteria to have an original design review permit modified versus having to have a new design review permit? design review permit in the case of a substantial modification to an existing design review permit the findings are the same and are laid out in the staff report i believe the um if it's a minor modification that doesn't change one of the key elements considered by the commission when it approved the approved the design or would otherwise be inconsistent with what was originally approved that's a minor modification that staff can approve okay. as is noted here staff approved the change in the roofing material and when it went back before the Planning Commission, they said this is just too substantial a change for us to be able to approve under a modified design review permit. It needs to come back before us with a new uh, uh, DRP. Well, the Commission's direction was we can't approve these modifications, meaning the applicant has two, but they did deny it without prejudice. So the applicant has two choices, uh, assuming the council, if, if the council approves, um, exactly what the Planning Commission did, the applicant has two choices. One, you could try anew with a new design review permit application, although it's the same findings, so I would expect the same result, or else apply to modify the design in some way, whether all the way back to what was approved or else um, something between what exists and what was approved. Alternatively, of course, the applicant could return the building back to what was approved. He retains the right to build exactly what was approved. And then there's some fights there. And my last question is, is it purely discretionary on our part whether we're going to accept this as a modification versus requiring a new DRP? Is it purely discretionary or are there any legal parameters that we have to pay attention to? The parameters are the findings that must be made to approve a modification, in this case a substantial modification to a design review permit. The other parameter is that any, from any elements of the design elements at issue that the council finds were in fact approved in 2013 become vested rights to which the applicant has that has the right to continue. The issue there is the applicant contends that the color was approved in 2013. Um, the planning commission majority concluded that the color was not approved in 2013. That's the first one for the council to consider is a vested right what was approved in 2013. The second is this second wall, the garden wall it's been referred to as was that approved in 2013 or not? Okay, thank you. I have one final question, Matt, while you're responding is, if it does go back for another DRP and planning rejects that, they appeal it, it comes back here again, correct? If they took so the route would, of applying so another DRP. technically we'd be back in the same spot that we are tonight. If the planning commission acted. So it chooses to do that. Right, okay. And I think the key variable there would be, does the applicant simply apply again for what has already been considered by both this council and the commission? Or does the applicant modify the design and apply for something different? Yeah. So where does that leave us? Do we have a motion? I'll look for. Look for you. Well, I'll. I'll uh, Most experienced. I will make a uh, a motion that we that we uh, grant the appeal. Is there a see where it goes. I would second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to grant the appeal. Is there further discussion? One point to bear in mind in terms of logistics, what's before you was drafted as a draft uh, resolution to deny the appeal, uh, as is the city's practice. To approve the appeal would require drafting a new resolution to reflect approval of the findings. So I would suggest that the, the maker of the motion might perhaps articulate a finding or two. Then the motion would be to uh, grant the appeal and direct staff to return to the next meeting with a resolution on the consent calendar reflecting that appeal in full and then that would be approved 
at the next meeting? <coughs> That'd be part of my motion. Uh, I entered for approval, rather. <laughs> I uh, I just want to make a comment that having been ten years on the planning commission, I'm, I show with great deference changing something that they've looked at and uh, in their uh, responsibilities and taking their duties very seriously have decided that they can't do what I just made the motion to do. However, I also think that in looking at what the end result was, uh, the Planning Commission has to make its decisions far more administratively than we do, and they have to make their decisions really within the confines of the box that the Planning Commission operates within as, as well as staff operates within. One of the real pleasures of being on the council is we don't necessarily have to stay within that box to make our decisions. So that when we look at a, a project like this, um, to me, I like the end product better than what was originally approved. I have no problem with the second wall. I think that the color is consistent with the palette. Uh, I, it may look as though it's masked, but overall, as, as Councilman Haney said, that massing is going to change over time with the, with the landscaping and the foliage around it. So I have absolutely no problem looking at this particular end product and saying that I could approve it. Further comments? Is, was yep. the uh, amended motion or the substitute motion acceptable to the Yes, second? it was. Okay, so we have it moved and seconded. Um, I guess what's going through my mind is, uh, you know, we have a planning commission and, the, and they do, as you say, take their work very seriously and they do have uh, limitations or uh, parameters that they have to stay within. I'm trying to think of what is the remedy in this case and is the remedy better than what we have here. Uh, I would have to agree on, on just purely a uh, judgment thing. I think it looks, you know, very attractive. It certainly didn't. I don't think it detracted from the neighborhood, and it doesn't appear that the neighbors are concerned. It's kind of more of a procedural thing, and to ask the planning commission to uh, think again and think differently rather than their their best judgment. I don't see that that necessarily adds much to the process. So. I, uh, with that, uh, I just if I could just make one more comment, and and uh, Mr. Mayor, my my initial persuasion is to not grant the appeal because I believe that people should come back during the construction process and get approvals, and not come back, you know, asking for as I said, forgiveness rather than permission. So I'm persuaded though that what we have here is not only in the best interest of our community, but also in the best interest of the applicant as well. Okay. Further comment? No, I hope you grow something beautiful and that attracts bees on that wall. Okay, right. You know, I'd like to see hummingbirds and butterflies and bees. Francina, we, are, you know, we haven't had a vote yet, so they may want to you know, send the bees to your house. Um, you know, uh, um, Mayor, I just wanted to, 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 to uh, uh, chime in with, with uh, Councilman Blatt's. There is a planning commission that um, does have restraints and they do have guidelines and they do have a, a methodology to their madness and they do it well. Yes, and, correct. Um, and so I just, you know, I don't want this to, to, to go back to them thinking that this is something that's going to happen all the time. But um, again, the end results are better than actually the, the, friend end, the front end of this. So I have no problems with that. And and my my, my concern is the just what you were referring to, Paul. The you know the the idea of the what when I was growing up we called the Jesuit law that it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Uh, I don't think that should be the message, and that yeah. gives me some reluctance in uh, going against this. I just think the factual situation uh, you know requires. Yeah. Yeah. The king's equity. Yeah, and I and I had to be persuaded, uh, you know, in the opposite direction because that's my initial thought when somebody comes before it. I also want to point out that as I felt in a lot of decisions that came before the planning commission when I was on it, that I felt that if I had leeway, I would have approved something, and it was appealed to the city council, and ultimately they did approve it. I never felt bad about that, and 
in actuality, I would be a little disappointed in our planning commission if they had approved this because it is a little, it is a major change to what they looked at in Definitely. in 2013. So I think they did their job properly here, right. and it came to us yeah. for, for the ultimate decision. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If I were a planning commissioner, I would uh, <laughs> be a little disappointed if the council sent it back and yeah. said, you know. Mm -hmm change your mind. I don't mm -hmm. think they should have to change their mind. I think they gave their best judgment. I think it's yeah. an unfortunate circumstance. So, okay, if there's any, no further comment, why don't we have the clerk call the roll? Mayor Johnston? No, yes. Councilmember Blatz? Yes. Councilmember Haney? Yes. Councilmember Francina? Yes. Okay, uh, so did, uh, did the city manager and the city attorney get what they need? As far yes, we as do. It's our understanding the direction would be to return uh, to the city council at the March 14th meeting. We'll put a uh, item on the consent calendar, which would approve uh, the modification to the design review permit for this project under the fighting the findings that were stated as part of the motion. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Peggy, you have a comment? Hi, I just want to quickly um, clarify uh, a comment that I made earlier. Um, I used a uh, public Facebook post that Bill Moses had posted today um, in expressing uh, comments that were my own. He used a couple of terms that served as triggers for kind of a springboard for me to talk about my views on things. And Bill felt that I didn't, um, and correctly, that I didn't accurately um, express his views. And I just want to um, say, he said, I agree that our town has got too busy with too much traffic on weekends due to tourists flocking to Ojai, and while I have a tourist-dependent business, I also have lived here for 25 years and miss the more bucolic Ojai. So that more fully expresses Bill Moses' views. He went on to say something about, you know, he appreciated that the tourism brings in jobs, and I commented about that, and I the term bucolic tripped some of the puff pieces in my mind and I commented about that and I didn't want that negativity to be associated with Bill Moses because he's on our side. Thank you. Like Sounds like he's on both sides. But, uh, and, uh, and but that's Kavita. the risk Bill would post you on, on Facebook. Day, you're, you're probably still watching. Yeah. Who, yeah. Whose side are you on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, who's we, did, we have not uh, done uh, what the council reports and manager reports. Right. So uh, right. should we do the manager report first and then we'll right. thank uh, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. For, for those who are uh, still remaining in the seats in the uh, chambers, you may have noticed we're trying a little different seating arrangement this time. Uh, we wanted to see if we could get a few more folks into the chambers this way, so we're trying this out and looking for some feedback. So just wanted to announce uh, for those who are wondering why the room looked a little bit different, that's what we're doing. Wanted to give an update to the City Council on where we are on the short-term uh, property rental enforcement. I do have a handout here that I can give to you. Uh, this is a report that, um, as of to date, um, and this is an update since the last formal update was provided to the council on July 8, 2016. Since that time, um, seven cases have been closed. Uh, those cases have either had a compliance agreement or the ads have been removed or the owners have provided documentation that the short-term rentals are no longer taking place. Uh, we are currently um, act, uh, monitoring 38 non-active cases. Uh, those are, th those are uh, cases that have had no active advertisement or uh, lodging complaints since fall of 2016. Uh, staff is continuing to monitor those to confirm compliance. Uh, and if new advertisements are found, they will be moved to the active cases. There are 13 cases right now uh, which are pending and which additional review needs to be done to verify if the advertisement was actually removed after receiving notice from the city. Uh, we have two active cases with verified violations. Uh, those have been found actively advertising for short-term rentals as of uh, February 22nd. The uh, properties will be issued citations and the owners will be contacted to see if they want to enter into a compliance agreement uh, or fines will be levied. 
And then we have uh, three uh, new short-term rentals, uh, three new properties that are advertising short-term rentals that staff has verified. Uh, monitoring and research will begin to verify the property location and we will move forward with, the, with enforcement on those. Uh, we continue to monitor the sites as appropriate on a weekly basis. Uh, we will close cases if no violations are verified for a period of three months. Uh, we will issue cease and desist letters to those who are violating uh, the short-term uh, rental regulations, including advertising. And we are issuing citations to those who have received the cease and desist letter and continue to operate in violation of the code. We have to answer any questions. Yeah, I have one question, uh, one question for you, Steve. Um, is advertising the primary uh, method of uh, trying to assess whether or not there's a violation? Because in some cases, uh, the uh, ads get taken down, and then I've had people send me screenshots of ads that have been uh, run in places that we're very familiar probably to all of us. So uh, we're just wondering how that, that, when you say monitoring, what does that entail? Oh, so right. We, uh, we, we want to make sure that the ads aren't going back up once if they've stopped in other words if we've if we've seen that they were that they were advertising um, and if for some reason they they have stopped advertising um, either on their own accord or after receiving a warning from the city we continue to watch those uh, for a period of three months to make sure that they don't pop back up again okay th those are on the ads those but, are on the as ads. far as someone who says okay well all right, I'll, I'll advertise a different way where you won't catch me or I won't advertise at all, but I'm still doing it. Is there any... Uh... So on that case, it's a little more challenging um, because we either we need something that we can verify to be able to, uh, some type of evidence to show that they actually did, you know, rent the property illegally. Um, one of the ways that we've been doing that is um, relying on uh, reviews that people do post online. Um, and uh, the other ways that we've, you know, we've, We've been able, to a certain extent, we can rely on uh, neighborhood complaints, but again, that doesn't actually provide the, the specific evidence. Right. So okay. I think part of it is to try to come at them from multiple uh, directions. Uh, I understand your point. Um, you know, part of the reason why I think the council went the step of going to go after the advertising was exactly the, 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 the fact that you bring up. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to continue to probably still rent and, and get away with that. But the problem is if you're not advertising in a way that people can find you, it's going to make your ability to, you know, it's not going to be nearly as lucrative. Uh, but it, it is challenging, though, particularly if we don't have a review that we can point to, uh, because unfortunately, you know, out-of-state license plates or people coming and going or, you know, even seeing some type of a pattern, now that, that's, you know, we're not fools here. We can say, okay, it sure appears to walk like a duck and talk like a duck. So, you know, let's let's try to observe it and see if we can confirm that it's a but, duck. But we do keep kind of a master list of people yes, who at we one do. time or another were sort of flagrant in their approach. <laughs> yes, we do. We've got I was sort of astonished when I saw one of them not too long ago from someone <laughs> quite well known to all of us and a friend of mine. And I thought, what is going on? Right. Uh, I didn't know if it was a joke or not, but okay. So you are, uh, I'll talk to you more about it later. Yes. But thank you. No, we, we realize we have to continue to watch for these and continue to watch for the ones that had advertised in the past to make sure they don't pop back up. Any other report from the city manager? Um, yeah, I wanted to hand out, um, it's very informally, this is a, a very informal budget calendar. We're getting towards that time of the year. Um, if you could take one and pass that one down. And, um, we started the process at the staff level. Um, we would be distributing um, something to council um, probably in late April. And under this schedule, uh, we're proposing that we hold our first budget workshop in May. And, um, we would then uh, finalize that mid-May and distribute it to the council and the public at that time. And we'd be looking to then have a second budget workshop on May 23rd. And if everything stays to uh, stays <coughs> on the calendar here, uh, we would uh, be going to city council for potential adoption on, on June 13th. Uh, we picked that date because it gives us a little bit of a cushion. Um, we have to have a budget adopted by July 1st. So if we, uh, we did and built a little bit of room into this calendar for uh, for
for delays. So if we do get pushed back on the 13th, um, as long as we get something adopted uh, by June 27th, we would meet the July 1st deadline. So we're happy to answer any questions on that, and uh, there'll be much more to come on that. Um, I think that's all that I have for my report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, council reports, none from Paul. Uh. I, I had one, uh, um, one comment uh, that I ran by Steve, I just wanted to bring it to the council, that the um, Ventura County Watershed District uh, meets on a uh, monthly basis, and in the past we've had Greg Grant and his assistant um, represent us, and they've at times had a difficult time going to them, so I would like to um, request that um, Councilman Wyrick and myself be placed um, as our representatives on that on that board. And which um, board is this? It's the Ventura County Watershed District. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, it would just give us, um, we're, Bill and I are both committed to being a part of this water issue, and um, it's a three hour, four hour meeting monthly, and we're committed to do it. So um, if, unless, unless you all wanna jo join in and go to a three hour meetings, let me know. But, um, uh, Bill and I would like to share that responsibility with your blessings. Oh, Mr. Mayor, if I could ask Councilman Haney, is this uh, a permanent place on the board? I mean, have they requested that the city have yeah, somebody yes. permanently placed on the board? And is it one or two? One. So who would be the alternate? Who would be the primary? I'd be the primary and Bill would be the alternate. Okay. We'd probably, would staff would recommend that we bring that back. We could even put something on okay. consent calendar right. just for formal adoption by council if that's the no, pleasure no, of the council. Uh, yeah, because this is something that we all can attend and I think a yeah. lot of us have attended. Sure. Uh, I don't know exactly how it's organized, but yeah, we, we'll put it on the agenda and bring it back. Okay. Uh, Susan, did you well, have? I've, I've missed several water meetings in part because on, uh, I'm, you know, I'm on the Complete Streets Committee and in addition, we've been meeting on Thursdays with the Ojai Valley Bicycle Coalition, the Ojai Valley Green Coalition, to move the, um, the, re the plans for Ojai Avenue forward. And <clears throat> I, I'm, I'll have more to say about that at a future meeting, but I do wanna say that i um, got some interesting news this week, that there's a bill um, uh, in being introduced to so that state highways that run through local communities are safe and usable by transit riders, pedestrians, and cyclists. In other words, there's a bill that recognizes that many of these highways go in front of schools, through shopping, you know, the situation that we have in Ojai, and they should be handled differently. So if that bill passes, that's one more way that we can have a lot more clout to, um, do some good design work on Ojai Avenue. Some new, uh, some more, <coughs> some improved bicycle infra bicycle pedestrian infrastructure. I have uh, one more comment to that. Um, uh, Susie, can you also check and see on the complete streets? I'm not sure, is there, is there anything budgeted to actually do traffic studies regarding if we're gonna reconfigure the community streets, how we're gonna go about it? So that's, um, if you're not aware of it or if um, staff's not aware of it, maybe someone could come back to us and talk about that. Because it seems like traffic congestion is I'll, huge. I'll, I'll bring that question up tomorrow because we're meeting tomorrow. It'd be uh, it'd be a great opportunity if we're spending if we're spending money on evaluating this that a traffic study be a part of that. We'll get an answer to that question. Okay. okay. Yeah, and that brings up the whole issue of congestion on parking. Yes. Yes. Uh, on an yes, we're uh, I, on uh, I have just two items I wanted to, to raise. One, the uh, <laughs> the infamous leaf blower issue uh, that this was referred back to staff what last October I think or in, uh, late September. Uh, and my understanding, Steve, is that there's uh, that Greg's got something going for a demonstration. Pr uh, That's of correct. Alternatives. It, it would be uh, March 14th at 6 p.m. So it would be prior to the regular meeting that night at seven o'clock, and he'll he'll do it right at right here at City Hall on the the porch right behind the council chambers. It's open to any member of the public, and uh, it will be a demonstration, and there'll be an opportunity for folks to ask questions and, and give comments as well. Is this like one product or more than one product? Or I think they're I think they're looking to demonstrate multiple products. Oh, okay. Will Will this be pub publicized? Yes, yes, I believe uh, advertisement is uh, 
running in this week's Ohio Valley News. Great, okay. wonderful. Great. Thank you. And the other item is that my understanding is Amber's working to try to find a weekend in March that where the council can get together on a Saturday and start you know, before we get into budget to talk yes, about priorities Mayor. and discuss some of the you know, protocols and you know what uh, we're going to try to get accomplished. Yes, we are working on that date for you. Okay. I already RSVP. So, so I had a question on that. Um, so, the, uh, when the term retreat comes to me, mm -hmm. retreat is something that we do uh, privately and we go somewhere and and discuss. So, what I've heard when I read the email tonight, it was a public retreat. So, I think we need to call it that. That it, the, um, because of the, I had a little I confused used the term retreat. But <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, they, um, because I was confused, going, okay, um, why don't we just do it here like we normally do it? But if we're going to do it on a Saturday, that's fine with me too. Yeah, and we can do um, it here on a Saturday. It doesn't you make certainly can. A lot of times, organizations they go to it. Yeah, right. They go to a different venue. I don't right. know that that's necessary. Uh, it would be nice. The idea was that to, it would be nice. Is there a place yeah, you'd like to go? Yeah, somewhere nice, and I can give, <laughs> okay, well. give you 10 minutes of yoga. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. My, my, my interest is in us getting things kind of uh, sort of, uh, I have the record, one of the candidates who shall remain nameless during the last election made a really good point during the debate. If we have more than, you know, say, two or three top priorities, we don't have top priorities. Right, right. And so we need to take a look at what we need to focus on. Uh, and that doesn't mean we can't do everything else too if we get to it, but uh, and then. So are you and, and uh, Steve gonna get together and try and f formulate some type of an agenda? Right. Um, based right. on the past, um, but, you know, to uh, um, our past Councilman Savaro, he had, he really championed a priority list of, of um, issues and concerns facing the community and how we we're going to deal with them and creating these. Maybe we start from that and share that with um, with Mayor Johnson. Certainly and, can uh, share that with And then, like I said, because I'd like to see an agenda as to what we're going to talk about. It doesn't necessarily to be the priorities actually how you envision it, but it would be. No, I'm not even suggesting, I'm not even things. coming up necessarily with priorities. I just think that in a, in a setting other than the formal business meeting for us to sit down and talk about where we're going and what we're doing, the kind of workload the staff has, uh, some of the kind of endemic issues that uh, face the, the, uh, the, the staff and the procedures, the service to the public, is that kind of a conversation. Okay. We, you know, not necessarily to make any decisions, but to have the conversation. Yeah. Anyway, okay, and, good. And if so, I could just, for the record, make it abundantly clear that any meeting of the city council would need to be within the city limits, it would need to be publicly noticed and the publicly accessible and the public would be able to be there and, per, and, and they would need they would certainly be able to be there at the meeting and, and uh, they'd have the ability to provide public comment on any items on the agenda correct um, you know while we while we're thinking about this I know I've been to a couple we all have been to a couple of these public meetings and it's interesting I, when I was at the one for uh, the Recreation Center the architect had us all individually go to different tables um, and then collectively pick a leader and come back. I think it would be an interesting format for the council to maybe think about it that way, that each of us go chair a circle, um, be more intimate with the community, and then come back and actually talk about what we discovered via the community and then have an open discussion with it. I think it would be interesting to see how that well, might work. Yeah, the last, the last one that we had similar to this, we held it at the Women's Center or the Women's Club. And we had a facilitator um, that worked out really well. We got the mission statement for the city out of it and some things like that. Mm -hmm. But it did work out really well, and I can't remember who the facilitator was. It was somebody local, um, and it worked out. It worked out very well. However, there weren't very many people from the public there. There might have been a half a dozen, right. and that was it. What I'm hearing are sort of two different kinds of processes. Yeah. You know, one one is is sort of a stakeholders meeting type of thing where you go through all of that. The other is is sort of a uh, a team building cultural uh, corporate cultural shift amongst us folks who are trying to lead the community and the public. Obviously, under the Brown Act, you know the. They are welcome to attend. Most of them probably uh, would find it boring, but there would be a, some people who would like to attend, but they wouldn't be necessarily participants, but under the Brown Act, they would have the right to, right. to uh, make comments to us. But the purpose, at least what I'm suggesting we do, is us to get to know each other uh, more in a, in, a, in a setting that allows us to explore 
what are, what are the issues that we're faced with uh, both at the staff level and at the council level and where do, where do we go you know things like you know we got general plan we got lots of things to talk about uh, we're not going to get it all done on a Saturday but at least if we could kind of agree on which ones we want to focus on then maybe to hold some stakeholder meetings uh, they, they would be part of that process in the future I, I guess my take on it was um, uh, it's grassroots effort and building um, a consensus on policy and priorities from the bottom up rather than from the top down because I think there's a lot of times that, that we sit up here and are dictating right. to the and community versus the community having the opportunity to come to us publicly and say, hey, these are our priorities. So that, that's um, yeah, right. where I was trying to, to right. come Right, and I'm, I'm just saying, I think th those are two different processes, yes. and I think they both yeah. have merit. One, yeah. one takes a lot more organizing, mm -hmm. and as you I say, agree you with really do need a facilitator for a big meeting, but if we had the, the, uh, the top uh, administrators in the city and the council, uh, the city attorney just sitting down and kind of going through things, maybe from saying you can have lunch brought in 9 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon and see what we can right. come mm -hmm. up with. Yeah. And, then, and one of the yeah. things may be exactly what you're talking about. Let's okay. have a public meeting. Okay, is there anything else that we want to talk I just about? have one other question. Is there any update on the, on, is it this week that we have the, the appeal to the I was the actually going to mention supervisors? that. Yeah, it's actually, it's set for Tuesday, March 7th at 1.30 p.m. And that is okay. before the... Board of Supervisors at the County Government Center in Ventura. And that's the appeal on the school, the trucks. The Ohio Quarry. Right, Quarry. right, 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 okay. the issue with the trucks, Thank you. right. And we are coordinating with the school district and Mr. Shapiro. Good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There's nothing further. Uh, thank, thank you guys for hanging out with us. Yeah. <laughs> the meeting stands adjourned. Great.